Thank you, Kayla. Hello. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, and could you also give me control when you get a chance? Thank you. Um, good afternoon, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen. This is House Economic Matters. We're starting our bill hearings. It's the 10th of March, um, one of our last bill hearing days today. Um, we get ready to get started. Just remember, we are being recorded at all times. So um, obviously use decorum. Uh, for everybody listening, please understand that you'll have two minutes to discuss your, your bill. For those, uh, we don't time our sponsors, but we do ask them to be respectful of your colleagues as far as the amount of time you take to lay out your bill. And um, lastly, chat is only for the members. So please, if you're not a member of this House Economic Matters Committee, please do not enter anything into the chat. We will beginning, uh, be beginning with um, Delegate Fraser Hildago, House Bill 171, his perennial bill. Um, whenever you're ready, David. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. If it's all right, I'll bring my uh, virtual um, team up with me. So we'll just I mean, one after the other. I, you can tell me what order you'd like me to call them in. Okay. Um, uh, Wandra, Wandra uh, Williams. Um, with Climate Exchange. Okay. Arthur Watts with Family of Smith Road and Mike Tidwell with CCAM, if that's all right. Uh, okay. Who was before Mike Tidwell? Rosman Watts. All right. Thank you. May I proceed? Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the of the committee, <clears throat> I bring back, uh, I know this is a couple of years now, so I'll try to be quick because I know you've heard this um, for a couple of years now. Uh, House Bill 171, the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act. The bill is fairly similar to what it's been in the past few years. Um, for just a, a refresher, um, it basically charges a cost of, uh, of carbon. So when, when fossil fuels come into the state, there's a cost associated with, with the totality of burning fossil fuels. And this helps to make an adjustment to ensure that the total cost of burning fossil fuels in the state is, act, is actually covered by the fossil fuel industry and is not borne by the citizens and the taxpayers and the residents of the state of Maryland. <clears throat> As many of you know from prior hearings, um, we are in the midst of a, a climate crisis. Um, and you know, uh, this committee knows better than others that over $15 billion a year is actually spent by uh, the state of Maryland to purchase electricity from neighboring states. Um, in most cases, those are very dirty fuels, which then end up just blowing um, and making our air quality um, worse in the state of Maryland. And then we're spending $15 billion a year buying that electricity. So this is going to help um, ensure that we develop more uh, electricity, homegrown electricity and storage here in the state of Maryland. Also, many of you know that we spend over $27.7 billion in public health, specifically in dealing with children with asthmatic related issues and bronchi related issues. Again, this can be avoided uh, in large part if we change our economy and change the way we do business and we stop burning fossil fuels. If we start driving more electric cars, if we start driving more electric buses, by the way, thank you to this committee for my electric bus bill. Um, and if we start generating more and storing more through renewables, uh, that would help everybody. <clears throat> Again, um, the bill, as many of you know, uh, is job is to reduce overall emissions in the state 60% 60, 60 by 2030 and 100% by 2040 using the 2006 metrics. Um, it establishes two type of fossil fuels, including non, -trans uh, including non, -non transportation fuel fees and, and transportation fuel fees. Um, it creates a climate crisis council, which most of you are already familiar with. Um, it establishes a, a couple of funds, and those funds are to ensure that those folks that are in the lower socioeconomic echelons are, are, are held um, are made whole. So if there are costs involved with them, that they are made whole through um, the comptroller's office. Again, I've talked a lot about this in prior years, so we can talk more about it. Um, and with that said, the only other thing that I want to make sure everybody knows, and I'm happy to work with advocates um, either for or against in the future, is that, and I want to make sure I'm very, very clear on this. Look, th this is really about the fossil fuel industry. Um, I want to make sure everybody knows that. This is about the fossil fuel industry, knowing what they've been doing, knowing and doing what they've been doing for the last 40 or 50 years and knowing what it's doing to the public health 
uh, of our kids, of our, of our folks in the state of Maryland, around the world. They knew what they were doing. They've known what they were doing. And it's time they start paying for what they're doing to try to compensate and, and to try to make us whole. Um, we don't pay. They don't pay for the total cost of doing business. They don't pay for the total cost of burning fossil fuels. So with that said, I will say um, my interest is in dealing specifically with the fossil fuel industry, not the utilities. The utilities, um, I, I don't have an issue with, and I would really like to work with the utilities in the future to um, to get everybody on on the same page as as far as this as far as this bill is concerned. And with that, Mr. Chair, if if you will, um, either pass to my to my other colleagues uh, on this bill or whatever your pleasure. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to Wanda Ashley Williams. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Chairman and uh, committee members. I am Wandra Ashley Williams, Regional Director for Climate Exchange Maryland. And I'm here today speaking on behalf of the Rebuild Maryland Coalition. We are a coalition of over 70 organizations representing thousands of hundreds, I mean, tens of thousands of members. While addressing climate risks and mitigating their consequences must be among the state's top priorities, we must ensure that economically vulnerable communities be protected from any additional cost in the transition to a clean energy economy. That is exactly what HB 171 does. It uh, charges the polluters, as the sponsor has just said, for the damage that they have caused and does no harm to the community. In fact, this policy uses the uh, revenue from the carbon, carbon fee to uplift these communities. HB 171 also complements nicely several environmental climate policies that you are considering this year, the session is considering this year. Uh, I can't talk about all of them because I don't have time, but 50% of the proceeds of not the proceeds, but the revenue in this bill will go to an infrastructure fund that will fund those projects. So with that, I ask you to um, approve this uh, legislation, to pass this legislation that is so needed. We can, we have to, we can't continue to kick the can down the road. Let's be real about it. We need to act now. And let's make Maryland the first state with the courage to make the polluters pay for the damage that they have caused. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. Now we we'll go to Rosalind Watts. Good afternoon, uh, committee, and to our chair. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I live in District 37, uh, Subdistrict 37B, and I'm a member of the families of Smithville Road. Now, Smithville is a home to a predominantly African American community that was founded and populated by a group of first and second generation freed slaves and their descendants. The community is nestled inland just a few miles away from the Chesapeake Bay and it has been battered by the effects of climate change, sea level rise and environmental justice issues as well. Historically, this community was graced with beautiful woodland timber and good soil for family gardens. However, due to marsh encroachment, increased tidal flooding and invasive migration of the Phragmites and our property owners have lost large portions of their land. When community members sought to remedy the effects of the marsh migration and the effects of the Phragmites, they were prohibited from doing anything, being told that these were protected vegetations and protected habitats. And over time, coupled with sea level rise, uh, the homes of my people and our properties, including our historic family cemetery, is in imminent danger due to increased flooding, tidal changes, basically erosion and the loss of land. Now research with universities and environmentalists and local authorities indicate that we need further studies and remediation. The climate action plan that the CCEJ will provide funding for is needed to preserve these properties and human habitats. Mediation is doable, but costly. So the revenue from this bill is key to our survival. We believe that we can save our land and our cemetery, but action and resources must be available quickly and decisively. Climate change is affecting our world, and this bill develops the resources we need to address these issues. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. We now have Mike Tidwell. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I'm Mike Tidwell, Director of the Chesapeake Climate Action Network and CCAN Action Fund. We are a regional 
advocacy group committed to clean energy solutions to the climate crisis. And on behalf of our 20,000 members in Maryland, we urge a favorable report on HB 171. Um, this is a really thoughtful bill. Uh, it is fair. Uh, it is good for our economy. And I want to thank uh, Delegate Frazier Hidalgo for the perfecting that he's done over the years to make this bill better. Um, climate change is happening, as we just heard from Rosalind. It's happening in communities all over Maryland. We know Ellicott City got 2,000-year floods in 22 months. This is only going to continue. To address this issue, to address adaptation, to address uh, the transition to cleaner, sustainable energy, we need money. We all know that. Um, and who other than the polluters should pay this? I mean, the polluting industries want us to believe that we cause global warming individually. And the reality is, no, these industries have deceived us. They've distorted the science and they are accountable, just like the tobacco industry has been held accountable for the amount of suffering they've caused in the past. So in the past, uh, when this bill has come before this committee, uh, folks have appropriately said, how are you going to protect low and moderate income people? If you read the bill closely, you'll see amazing protections. Uh, for those folks, we've been asked, well, how do you protect businesses, carbon intensive businesses who are trade exposed outside the state? There are features in here for that. How do you uh, protect rural folks who drive a lot? It's in here. So I think this is a thoughtful, creative bill. Uh, the moment has come to hold the polluters accountable to get the funds we need as a state to adapt and manage the crisis of climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you. And before we go on with our questions, we have a we have to welcome Delegate Stewart, Delegate Gilchrist, and Delegate Otto from uh, ENT that are over here uh, witnessing this bill. Thank, thank you, colleagues, for joining us. Um, I see we have a question from um, Delegate Ernst. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This question for <clears throat> anyone that spoke already. Um, based on the facts that we actually are not producing anywhere near even 15% of our renewable energies in Maryland, and that means, if I do my math right, 85% of that energy is being produced by these polluters. And we're going to be charging these polluters that we're buying energy off of every day more money. Can somebody please tell me how this will lower our rates? So, um, <clears throat> if nobody else wants to jump in, I'm happy to, to jump in. Um, I know you as Delegate Arndt, so I don't know who... E yes, stream is, but I'm going to refer to you as Delegate Arntz, if that's okay. That's You call me anything you want. You can, <laughs> I'm all good with that, David. So, so um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, Delegate Arntz, I don't, I don't know that it's really, um, that this bill is really about lowering electric costs as much as it's about cleaning up energy costs. And as we go, placing the, um, the responsibility of who pollutes and how they pollute squarely on their shoulders. So there is a no pass through clause in the bill, as you're probably aware of from last year. It helps prevent that from being passed through. If it does get passed through, we still have the backup fund of 50% of these revenues are gone to make sure people are, are held whole or are not harmed. Um, and again, you know, we we have to, and, and then the other 50% goes to, you know, climate change related issues. So we have to figure out, and your committee is uniquely situated and does this work all the time. We need to figure out how to transfer not only this piece, but that $15 billion I, I mentioned earlier that, that is spent outside the state. We need to develop that, those electrical, the electrical grid, and we need to, to develop um, renewables here in the state of Maryland and storage here in the state of Maryland. And then, so half of this, half of the revenue that this generates um, can be used for those kinds of things. Uh, so, I mean, I, I hope that answers I, your question. I really appreciate the bit. No, it didn't answer my question. My question is how will this lower the rates for the people? Everybody agrees that I don't think there's anybody that's not saying we, we're, we should be looking at clean energy. I don't think that's an issue anymore with right. anyone right now. Thank you. Based on that and based on what we're doing already with this RPS, these goals that we have, this unrealistic 30% where we're hitting maybe 12 or 14%, based on that, we're already paying a premium for our usage. Everybody is that is doing that. We're throwing all these dollars that you're talking about into a kitty to fund this, this study as we're moving forward. But 
Maryland probably does not even have the ability to produce the renewable it's going to use or will require. If we are forcing ratepayers to buy fossil fuels and so-called clean energy from other states when they're not even close to the numbers that Maryland's trying to get, and somehow that's making us a better state. We can't produce it, but we'll take advantage of whatever clean energy Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey, and all those other states are having at a premium for our ratepayers, okay? And we're saying somehow in this magical formula that we're gonna cut we're gonna cut the rates for those that need it the most. Well, what we'll do is we'll raise them so high that other people will be footing this bill to fund that. But it's disingenuous for us to sit up here as, as politicians, as legislators and say that, you know what, we're gonna charge everybody a whole lot of more, whole lot of money to build an industry which isn't ready to be built yet. And we're gonna to continue to do that and put it on the backs of our ratepayers and somehow convince the people that are out there paying these bills that we're doing a good thing for them. Granted, it's a, it's a great idea, it's a great thought, but it's disingenuous to put this out there and say, this is a good bill and we're gonna cut rates. I listened to a couple of people tell me, we need to take care of the lower income people. I agree, but this bill isn't gonna take care of them. The only way it takes care of them, it'll raise the rates high enough that they won't be able to afford it and they'll have to draw on the state to, to recoup their dollars. Isn't that so? No, that is not, well, uh, Delegate Arntz, um, a vast majority of the revenues from this bill are coming from the fossil fuel industry. So I think that's important to understand. It's coming from the fossil fuel industry as where it should come from. They're the ones that have done all the damage here and the total externalities of the damage that they've done, they have never, they have never been held accountable for. And this is the beginning of holding them accountable for what, for what they've done. It's not about the ratepayers having to pay for it. It's about the fossil fuel industry having to pay for it. They should pay for what the damage they've done. They should repair all of those kids' lungs that they've damaged. They should repair all of the, the shoreline that's disappearing. Um, because we've been burning fossil fuels and they've known, their scientists have known about what they've been doing for over 40 or 50 years. So, um, you know, to, to continue to do what we're doing is insane. I'm not saying Obviously, we should. Yeah. I, I'm really, a Delegate, I'm not going there. And to think that mm-hmm. somehow the fossil fuel industry is going to sit back and say, okay, we're going to take a loss on everything we produce and we're going to get, we're now going to pay a premium for this and it's not going to affect the, the ratepayers. Just, it's just not genuine. But I appreciate the conversation and we probably could go on for the whole afternoon on this, but I don't think we're being fed the right lines and we're not being told the absolute consequences of this. But thank you very much for your answers. Delegate Arnold, right. I will close with saying, if you'd like to work with me on the interim to address those issues, I would be happy to sit down with you and start. I would love to do that. And you know, you know, I'm sincere when I say that. I absolutely do know you're sincere. I absolutely thank know you. That. Thank you. Okay, Delegate in Polaria. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Delegate, you know, I believe you did answer Delegate Ernst's question right off the bat. You said it really doesn't matter to you if the cost goes up. This isn't about saving money for the ratepayers, and it isn't about making it cheaper. It's about destroying the fossil fuel industry. And from what I'm hearing from you is apparently there was a trial somewhere. The fossil fuel industry was found guilty by a court. They've been charged with destroying our world, and now they have to pay the fines and penalties. The only problem is I don't know when that trial took place. And I also would say right now that the policies that you're pushing and you're promoting in this committee, first off, isn't 100% genuine with the information that we're receiving. And number two, obviously, none of you have went to the grocery store and looked at the prices caused by trying to cut us off from fossil fuels or have been to the gas pumps and looked at the prices. And that price at the gas pump, eh, it affects me, but it affects that poor person in my district way more than it affects me. I'm just a little bit above poor. I don't know how the poor guy is paying an extra, you know, $40, $50 a month in fuel when he's having a hard time paying his mortgage payment. So, you know, I got to be honest, I've been sitting here 20 years and I would love to work on a policy that works. This policy doesn't work hasn't worked. Solar panels will last 20 years. That's it. Then they have to be replaced. I could care less about recycling them, but they have to be You have a question, sir? Yeah, 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 I do. So it's, and we heard from other panels on the same subject that we're going to use nuclear power to try to supplement, supplement all this. So it does work. Are you for nuclear power, Delegate? Do you support nuclear power to make this work? Because there is none and your people are against it. So, okay, what, so what is your answer to that? 
if it's if it's okay with the vice chair, let's back up because you asked, I think, I don't know, 37 questions. And I'm going to try to get to the ones that well, I've been I can 37 things that, that I don't believe in and I don't believe is true. Okay. Well, why, why don't we have a respectful discussion about that? Sure. Sure. So um, first, first of all, is as far as this bill, this bill hasn't passed. So what's happening at the pump has to do with a lot of other things that don't have anything to do, you know, with this bill. So the bill hasn't passed as far as what's going on in the pump. That is supply chain. That is COVID. That is war. That is a bunch of other things. So let's put that piece aside. And global right warming is part of it, cutting off the use of fossil fuels. So, yes, that is part of it. Shutting okay. down the Keystone pipeline, stopping fracking. Yeah, that's all part of the price at the pumps. Yes, it is. Which goes to your global warming policies. Go ahead. Okay. So um as 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 far as um a trial is concerned, I, I don't I don't think I, I missed that um that trial either. There there should be a trial for what's happened. I mean, again, the fossil fuel industry, all the science here, Delegate in Polaria, is very clear as what's going on. And so I, I I'm in a position. Science. I, I, don't, I don't I don't believe I believe the science that when a tree falls in a forest and decays naturally, it has the same exact carbon footprint as if you burnt it in a furnace. That's the science. That's true. We've heard different from your side. OK, that is the science. And that's true. So we're trying to come to a, a middle ground here to start getting some truth. Hold, rather hold than on. Just hold on. Hold on. I, I'd like to be. Able let's, to let's, OK, hold on. Hold on. Let's let's kind of lower the temperature a little bit. Delegate Impolari, we gotta let him respond. I know there was a lot in there. And then mm -hmm. Delegate Frazier is all go. If you could just quickly respond, we'll just ask whoever, whatever witness we want questions, we'll be respectful about it, and then we can move on. We don't need to scream at each other. Thank you. Um, so there's that piece. The, the, the last piece that that you mentioned. Uh, I don't know where this fallacy comes around that solar panels are only good for 20 years. Solar panels are still producing electricity at north of 65 and 70 percent efficiency from their original manufacture date that are 30 and 40 years old. But I keep hearing over and over and over again about how solar panels need to be thrown away after 20 years. I, I don't I don't get that. Um, that is uh I will just leave it at that to say that that's not true. Well, I'll tell mm -hmm. you, that's the testimony we've received in this well, committee from the solar industry for the last 20 years. Well, that's that, where that's, the information comes from. I, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to send you some scientific-based research, but solar panels last way longer than And when you years. lose 40% of your ability to produce after 20 years, it's time to replace you. You're, you're, you're not working anymore. Okay, we can, we can have <laughs> conversations offline and debate the merits and, of solar. And... Uh, De Delegate yeah. knows I, I love him and respect him very much. And it, it, this is it's the conversation. And um, we just disagree on this issue. And I just want to make it clear to those people that, that I don't agree with the information that we're getting from the global warming side. And that's okay. simple. I, I respect his opinions, but he's entitled to his truth, but I'm entitled to my truth. Yeah, and I, hopefully somewhere in the middle Delegate in Polaria is the real truth. So... <laughs> All right. Just just a reminder for everybody, you know, look, I know conversations will become intense and heated and debated and we may not always agree, but let's please just ensure that we are treating everybody that comes to our committee or committees in this instance with respect. Delegate Mounts. Um, thanks, Chairman. I'll try to um, not drag on too long. And I'm not sure who the best witness is, is to answer this, but I'm, I'm trying to understand how this would work for um, uh, for for energy for electricity in particular. So, if your electricity is coming from out of state, how would Maryland impose a fee on a generator out of beyond our state lines? How how is conceptually does that work? I will let one of the other advocates. I've dominated the conversation too much already. I'm happy to have, have one of the other advocates answer that question. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would like uh, for um, my research person to answer that question, if that's okay. That's Jonah. Okay, has, has he, he, he has signed up. Okay. Has he or she testified yet? Not yet. I'll, okay. So, I'll hold the so, question in and we'll yep, ask later. Let's, let's get I'll, through a couple more witnesses. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, when Jonah comes up, they'll get mounts. Uh, I'll go to you first, okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, uh, I believe we're on Chandra Dawson. Yes, thank you. Members of the committee, 
It has recently been brought to my attention that there is a bill being introduced for legislation titled the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act, a bill I hope will define redemption by a careless century to the coming generations. The bill proposes that private corporations give an unprecedented license to despoil our land, air, and water, be made to pay the public who suffer the damages of their brutal enterprises. Indeed, as the damages increase, so would the payments, until mercifully future industry projections will show what common decency could not. Destroying the fruits of the earth is ultimately unprofitable. I am reminded of what is referred to as the tragedy of the commons, enclosure or the sale of common land began in England during the 16th and 17th centuries. The enclosure laws were feverishly fought against by the common people from the onset, whose restricted access to the natural resources of those lands threatened their quality of labor and life. However, under a monarchy, the enclosure laws only stretched and strengthened to become a harbinger of the industrial revolution that would rapine its way across the whole of the Western hemisphere. Capitalism is the incorrigible grandchild of the tragedy of the commons and its insistence on illimitable growth at any cost. To this day, our modern myopia still recognizes this state of affairs as private enterprise, but for the people who are forced to manage what they do not control, there is nothing private about it. The Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act has done all the work for the committee by stating the gravest reasons for passing this bill in its very title. I urge you to demonstrate your position of authority where it is most necessary for the general welfare of both the land and its people. Protect the commons. Thank you, ma'am. We'll now go to Wandra Ashley Williams. I testified already. Oh, okay. Rosalind Watts? She did as well. She did. This, I guess, was the panel. Okay, David Saunders. Mr. Vice Chair, oh, you should you also have, though. You should also have, thank you. Um, I'm Sorry. I'm ahead. David Saunders. Can you hear me? Go ahead, sir. Okay, so I would like to uh, illustrate what this bill actually would, would do. Um, in, in the way of a true story. So it was a cold day. My gas furnace stopped working. A repairman came to my house. He told me my manifold was cracked. Carbon monoxide was leaking. And he placed a red tag on my furnace and said it was against the law to restart my furnace. And I thought to myself, that was a good law because the law protected me and protected my family from carbon monoxide poisoning. And I want to thank you for passing that law. The next day, a salesman came to my house to arrange for a new furnace. I asked him about a heat pump that would be good for the environment. He said, no, 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 you don't want a heat pump. I said, why not? He said, well, in Pennsylvania, they passed a law that made fracking legal, and you want gas because it's cheaper. And I bought the gas. I said, that sounds fine. What he didn't tell me, and I know now, that my gas was 1,026 therms, which produced 5.4 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent that goes into the atmosphere for 100 years. He probably didn't know. I didn't know, but now I know. So now what happens with this new law? So I'm just going to take you into the future. So we passed the new law that I'm suggesting you pass, the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act. And let's say now it's 10 or 15 years later and I need another furnace. So the salesman comes to my house in 10, 15 years from now and he says, don't put another gas furnace in. I say, why, why not gas again? He says, well, because Maryland years ago, they passed a pollution fee on burning gas. He says, you'll be better off with an electric pump. And if you put 100% wind power on, you'll no longer be polluting the environment you won't be contributing to climate change and your children will be safer. So I did a little research and I find that countries like Canada, Norway and Switzerland, they've been having, they've been charging a pollution fee on oil and gas burning for a long time. So I think this is a modern uh, intelligent use of government policy. And I think the, the law is well um, designed. I read it through completely and I urge you to pass it. 
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Soraya Ben. Thank you. My name is Saria Ben, and I'm from the place. Oh, sorry, can't get it here. I'm from the Policy Foundation of Maryland, and I'm in favor of HB 171. We are a grassroots organization focused on state and county legislation out of uh, Hartford County, and our policies uh, support the impacts on Black, Brown, and marginalized low income communities and veterans affairs. Why do we think CCEJ is important? It reduces harms and protects marginalized and most vulnerable and low income Marylanders. It embraces the green economy that we have to transition to. Um, it, it moves away from fossil fuel jobs to high paying green energy jobs. But more importantly, it allows local jurisdictions to invest up, up to approximately $500,000 into a climate plan. Why is that important? A few years ago in Hartford County, they had approved the commercial zoning of a property, a property that was gonna to use to turn into a tire paralysis uh, factory, which was gonna be located within five miles of six schools that were brand, uh, that was majority black, brown and marginalized communities. Ultimately, it was defeated through grassroots advocacy in a circuit court decision that determined that material and information, which was not given to the public, that this, it, and was not in the zoning code itself, should, should have been made to the public. I believe that if we had that climate plan that's in the CCEJ, it possibly could have been not an overwhelming and costly fight to the local act activists. And this is not just one struggle. We're in another struggle in Southern Hartford. We're fighting the, the mass industrialization of Perryman Peninsula, a 5.2 square mile historical district stretch, which is considered the seventh largest warehouse district in the Northeastern area of, of America. We have nine endangered animals. We are located a mile near the Chesapeake Bay. Bush River is there. We have, we have warehouses that have secret items and chloride to dripping stuff out into the sediment ponds in that area. And this is also a historical black district. So I say to you, the CEJ will provide funding to low and moderate income families as well as local governments. This bill is economically as well as environmentally and addresses a significant portion of Maryland. I'm wrapping it up. Okay, um, I'm wrapping it up last sentence. It also begins to address the many centuries of climate crisis and inequity in marginalized communities. I urge you to give a favorable report on 171. Thank you. Thank you, Thaddeus Waterman. I just wanna start by uh, thanking the members of the committee for their time today. I appreciate being involved in this process. Uh, my name is Thaddeus Waterman. I live in District 22 in Hyattsville, Maryland. And today I'm here to voice support for HB 171 on behalf of the Citizens Climate Lobby Maryland leadership. Citizens Climate Lobby is a national, nonpartisan, volunteer-driven climate advocacy organization. Here in Maryland, our chapters consist of over 3,000 residents from across the state. When we asked our volunteers whether they supported or had concerns for endorsing the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act, our Maryland leadership team, which entirely consists of volunteers, didn't raise a single objection. As we have continued to discuss internally, we are seeing nothing but overwhelming support from our members. Our volunteers, Maryland residents from all across the state, recognize the value of this legislation and are committed to seeing effective climate solutions passed. The Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act would be a big step in the right direction for Maryland to address climate change. With its steadily increasing carbon price, HB 171 is poised to encourage everyone, especially polluters, to share the task of reducing our emissions. And as we make the necessary transition from a fossil fuel economy to a sustainable economy, HB 171 also includes the provisions to support the most vulnerable populations through direct dividends. This is money that is going directly back into the pockets of your constituents to help them uh, make the needed transitions. This is key to ensuring those who will suffer the most if we don't act on climate change also aren't necessar unnecessarily suffering from our solutions to climate change. As our volunteers have demonstrated, Maryland residents want effective and fair climate policies, and they, they want them now. With the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act, Maryland can be a leader on climate that the rest of the nation can follow. Just want to again, thank you for your time today, and we urge a favorable report on HB 171. Thank you, sir. Jeffrey Johnson. Dear members of the committee, my name is Jeffrey Johnson, and I represent the Chesapeake Earth Holders Community of Engaged Buddhism. And I'm a professor emeritus at the University of Maryland 
and a public health scientist. We strongly support this bill because it will protect the health of Marylanders by reducing air pollution through stronger reduction goals and polluter fees on fossil fuels. The burning of fossil fuels is the major source of air pollution. It produces tiny particles in the air that are drawn deep into the lungs and enter the bloodstream, altering cells and causing lung disease, cancer, heart disease, stroke, and asthma, as well as cognitive and behavioral disorders, particularly among the young. Air pollution from fossil fuels is one of the major causes of death around the world and now kills nearly as many people as cigarette smoking. In the US, air pollution kills hundreds of thousands of people every year. People of color and lower income people have a much higher burden of air pollution, exposure, and disease. This bill addresses this inequity by investing in communities suffering from environmental injustice. Recent studies in the US have shown that lowering levels of air pollution results in dramatic improvements in public health. In conclusion, this act will reduce the use of fossil fuels and thereby lower air pollution levels which will significantly improve the health of Maryland's people. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Allison Jones. Okay, I do not see Ms. Jones. We'll go on to Coney Serrano. Thank you, Vice Chair. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Connie Serrano. Serrano. I'm a research and policy analyst at CASA, Maryland's largest immigrant rights organization. On behalf of our membership of over 120,000 black and brown immigrant and working families, CASA asked the committee for a favorable report to prioritize HB 171. We want to thank Delegate Fraser Hidalgo for his leadership and commitment to this bill to ensure we move towards a greener Maryland. We ask the committee to prioritize this bill today because the time to act for a healthier Maryland is now. Delaying efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions will have negative impacts and potentially irreversible consequences for our entire state, but it is communities of colors that are suffering the most. Uh, last month, University of Maryland researchers showed alarming data on how Marylanders are already suffering the consequences of poor environmental practices. It showed that 92% of the Maryland population meet the respiratory hazard index, meaning that most of the population is affected by toxins that affect the respiratory system. In those same findings, it was stated that 90% of the population in District 44A, Baltimore City, are on the data for air toxins cancer risks. CASA members come to our offices with various concerns about their health and safety, suffering from smog, air pollution, and other consequences of climate change. This is deeply alarming. We need to take action to reduce pollutants to improve human health, drive economic growth, and reduce vulnerability. The, to protect the health and well being of Marylanders, future generations, and Maryland's most vulnerable, pop vulnerable populations with low and moderate income households, we must invest in clean energy infrastructure now. For those reasons and so many more, CASA strongly recommends a favorable report on HB 171. Thank Thank you, ma'am. So the next two witnesses I don't see uh, in the in the Zoom. Uh, I'll still call them. The first we have Shariah Reddy. Okay, and then we have Elizabeth Nichols. I'm here. Okay, go ahead, ma'am. Hi, um, my name is Betsy Nicholas, and I'm executive director of Waterkeepers Chesapeake. We're a coalition of groups throughout the Chesapeake watershed uh, with most of our residents and waterkeepers in the state of Maryland currently. And um, just for limited time, I agree with the statements of many others who preceded me, but I want to talk a little bit about the economics. It's not as simple as um, just looking at how we're gonna tax potentially the oil and gas industry and how that gets passed to ratepayers, which is by the way, prevented in this bill. But currently the United States is paying $80 billion with a B in subsidies to oil and gas companies. And that means we don't have a free market here. This isn't a, you know sort of uh, your basic um, supply demand that we're working on and looking at here. 
it, it is somewhat mind boggling to think about that we're paying those who are polluting our environment, heating up the climate, destroying water quality, $80 billion a year, but we are. And so when we look at the economics of solar, wind, other opportunities in Maryland that are not being developed as much as they need to, we need to take into account that they are not receiving $80 billion a year. The amount you pay for the solar panels on my roof right here is what you pay. Um, and that when you take that amount of money into account that we would no longer have to pay to this polluting industry when we start to equal out the economics, um, the sustainable energy is simply much more affordable, long lasting, and doesn't carry all of these other externalities and harms along with it. So for all of those who were really concerned about the economics, I hope that helps. This is information from the Brookings Institute, and so it's readily available. But I would say that this bill will go a long way to fixing a multitude of problems and holding the polluters accountable. And um, I would ask for a favorable report. Okay, Linda DeWitt. Hi. Um, my name is Linda DeWitt. I'm owner of Solar Mowing, an emission-free landscape company based in Bethesda in Montgomery County. And I'm pleased today to voice support of HB 171. I've been using all battery powered equipment and charging it with renewable energy since 2009 when I started solar mowing. In these 14 years, I've never had an advertising budget. My experience shows that people are hungry to reduce their carbon emissions and be part of the climate solutions not just the well-to-do in certain zip codes, but people everywhere. We get frequent calls from folks outside our service area who we can't help. We get calls from Chicago and Cleveland. Also, our crew members, who by the way, earn more than state and county minimums, aren't subjected to nauseating fumes and deafening engine noise. If they have something in their ears, it's earbuds allowing them to listen to music or podcasts while they mow. Many of our customers working from home don't even know we're outside unless they see us through a window. I'm a small business, I realize, but my entire business model is based on providing a carbon-free service. Not only is this possible, it's profitable. The cost of not reducing these emissions and not acting in an environmentally just way is unimaginable. I wish it were 1992 or 2002, but in 2022, we must act boldly. I urge you to support and move forward this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia Plant. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Cecilia Plant, and I am the co-chair of the Maryland Legislative Coalition Climate Justice Wing. I'm representing our more than 30,000 members, which include environmental justice groups, faith groups, and environmental activists. Uh, we are in very strong support of HB 171. We believe that this bill strikes a very good balance between aggressive climate policy that will help us achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2045, and supporting those communities that have been most impacted by the dirty energy policies that we are trying to leave behind. It also takes a somewhat poetic approach in making the very entities who have become rich by flooding our state with fossil fuels to fund our transition to clean energy. We consider this bill a companion to SB 528, the Climate Solutions Now Act, since that bill's robust and bold attack on greenhouse gases would be even easier to implement with additional funds. We believe that the fossil fuel companies who have for decades knowingly caused the climate crisis that we are currently experiencing should be the ones to help reverse it. They have publicly touted the fact that they are spending billions to reverse the effects of climate change, but it seems that their efforts are not really effective and are designed to actually make our reliance on fossil fuels even greater. We think that the state of Maryland could do a much better job of investing in reducing green, greenhouse gases than the fossil fuel industry. This will have the effect of changing our course to a cleaner future while having the polluters pay for it. They have made their fortunes on the backs of Marylanders for decades. We believe it is time they gave back. 
and we ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Delegate Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so my question is, is for uh, Betsy Nicholas. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, you're, rep you're representing which organization? Uh, Waterkeepers Chesapeake. And I was gonna talk more about water, but economics seemed to be at the heart of the matter. Okay, and, and Waterkeepers Chesapeake are, are whom? Uh, nonprofit organizations working throughout the, the entire region, protecting local communities and water quality from- Got it, and you're an economist? I am not an economist. Oh, I am. But you, the, but you were testifying um, as if you were. You kept saying, you know, that you're representing yourself as an economist. I did not represent probably, myself as an economist. Well, that's good that you're correcting the record because if I were to replay the record, it would talk about all of these references to economics and how your experience in economics is this. I do a, have experience in uh, economics, but well, I am not an economist. Got it. So Nor you're testifying on. You're testifying on probably one of the most important bills that we will see in a long time that is literally a takeover of the economy. And when you mention economics, all I'm just saying is you might want to be careful before you represent yourself as knowing something that isn't so. So why don't I ask you this to make it easier? How will you, if this bill were to pass, how would you power the economy? Uh, well, I don't power the economy. Um, so, so, so Mrs. Nicholas, this is a very serious matter. If this bill were to pass, how do you plan on powering the economy? Do you mean providing energy and electricity or do you mean economic growth? How would you power the economy with energy? The bill takes away all sources of energy. That's for the most part. How would you, I, I presume you've read the bill. Yes. Um, okay, so how would you power the economy? We have plenty of methods currently available that we can use for And that. what are those methods? But, but that is also not the- What are those methods? The bill. What are um, those methods? That we have solar, wind, hydropower, um, and the, the purpose of the bill is actually not to take away sources of energy, but actually pay for the pollution as a disincentive for continuing- well, That is very, very, very disingenuous. That is not the purpose of the bill. Purpose of the bill is to crush all other choices of energy other than the, you know, solar, I guess, and wind is what you talked about. And, and what was the other one? Hydropower? Was that the, was that the other one? Which, so well, we it's hard. It's hard to if I can't finish a sentence to um, go to, ahead. I, I was talking that time, but go ahead. I, I want to be fair. Well, you were asking me a question, but I wasn't able to finish my prior sentence. So would you I, again, I, I'm still not clear if what you're looking at is economy in terms of economic growth yeah, or power I, for Maryland. I think he's trying to find out that if we're getting rid of all the fossil fuels uh, uh, as soon as we may seem to be then how would we indeed have the, you know, the power to run vehicles, cars, heat, electricity things? How are we going to produce the electricity in this current state? I believe, since I've dealt with my colleague for years, that that is the legitimate question he is asking. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So um, the bill doesn't, on the implementation day, shut off power supply. What it does is work to change the economics on how we are paying for it and who's paying what. And so this is going to be leading a transition. So while we're taking away some of the financial benefit for the fossil fuel industry through this bill, it's also going to give the opportunity to invest in growth of um, sustainable energy supplies for Maryland. So it won't be changed like hold on, that. Hold on, Mark, you gotta let her finish answering the question. But So it just won't, it won't change overnight. Um, but that's what this is doing is it's funding a transition. Okay. Got it. Uh, so, so the so the bottom line is is that there really isn't a plan with this bill. The bill is just a cancel culture type bill. Let's cancel all sources of energy oh except for the ones that we like um, and the ones that are our friends. And as to everyone else, we don't really have a plan. You see, and I just want to finish with this um, for your latitude, Mr. Chairman and Vice Chairman. Um, we see bills like this frequently in this committee. 
And I don't doubt that all of you folks on your side of the aisle are very serious about this. I don't doubt that. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is, is when you come before the committee, it relates to me, you need to have a plan. And the plan, the plan has to be real. Um, and it has to be actually based on economics with a background in economics. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, ma'am. I'm I sorry. Answer? No, he wasn't posing a question. I believe he was giving a statement. Okay. Uh, I understand. Thank you. There very is a much. plan. Thank you. And I'll go on to Delegate Harrison. Thank you so much. Um, interestingly enough, and this, this is directed to um, Delegate Frazier Hidalgo. In the front page of the Washington Post today, there is an article that um, talks about the uh, basically air quality in communities that had um, been redlined and how um, those individuals in those communities are still suffering from the effects of um, the, the dirtier air, basically. And so my question is, and I don't know if you've had an opportunity to see that article. Um, my question is with this bill and should it move forward um, and um, the plan that may come out of it, do you see um, this is helping those communities, those individuals, those communities that are still suffering? Um, because basically what's in those communities are, you know, the coal, coal uh, fire plants and just, just the, the basically the dirty energy producers, you know, they're close to highways. And so there's the, the emissions from the car uh, cars, just a lot of um, particulate matter that's in the air that affects um, individuals negatively. Do you think that this could be helpful um, in beginning to clean those communities? Or do you think that um, it's going to take a very, very long time and then generations afterwards will still be suffering? Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug, for the question. Um, yes, it will help those communities. I and mean, if you if you read the bill, I forget which page it's on, but there's an environmental justice, an environmental justice specific component to provide um, to, to make sure as we're evaluating and as we're moving forward that that is a priority, environmental justice being a priority of the bill. So as it becomes more expensive to burn fossil fuels, and as it becomes less expensive to develop renewables and other forms of, of electric generation and storage that will, um, that will change and um, those communities will get cleaner air and it will take time, but we have to start. And the sooner we start, the sooner that the air gets cleaner. I mean, it's taken well over hundred years to do the damage we've done now, and it's gonna take some time to reverse that, but the sooner we get started, the better. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was just coincidental that we had this bill as a first one and it's a front page of the news that I happened to be reading in the, uh, before we started session. So thank you, before we started community. Thank, thank you. you. Committee. I'll make sure I read it. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Chair, may I answer no, that as well? No, no, no ma'am. These are questions are very specific and posed to the individuals that are asking. All right, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, uh, Delegate Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to uh, go back to Ms. Nichols. Um, I know that Ms. Nichols, you do not have to be an economist to be able to speak about the economy. And I also know that you wouldn't be here if you didn't understand this was a serious matter. Um, and finally, I find your testimony genuine as opposed to disingenuous. So I'd like to give you an opportunity uh, briefly to explain or to answer Mr. Delegate Fisher's question of what is the plan in his context. Thank you, Delegate Watson, I appreciate that. Um, and I will just say for the record, I am not an economist, though I am the daughter of a professor of economics. So I think I've had it since birth. Um, I'm a lawyer and the, there is a plan in here. It's actually a really important part of this. You can't just you know snap your fingers and take away supply that we currently need. The plan here has to do with graduating the fee, inc increasing it over time while we're investing that in the ability to uh, develop the renewable energy supplies. So there's not gonna be any sort of local crisis caused by this. In fact, really to the opposite as to, you know, the discussion that we were just having about local pollution sources, coal, these are already shutting down. 
Um, but what we're really lacking in Maryland is what do we do next? We're having to buy it from out of state. So this is economic investment in Maryland funded not by Maryland taxpayers, but right now by the fossil fuel industry. And since they are currently getting over $64 billion directly in the United States every year, um, in addition to their profits, I think they can afford it. But uh, globally, that's over $5 trillion in subsidies they're receiving every year. So we're evening out that imbalance of power that they have right now through all of that money by helping to foster a, an economic environment where sustainable energy can take over and power our, um, our supply into the future. Thank you. Um, and uh, I have a question. I see one more question, Johnny. Give me, uh, uh, Doug at Fraser Hidalgo. I guess I have a two, uh, two part question. Uh, number one, um, when, and I, I know this sounds like, when did the fossil fuel industry become the villain? And I asked that in the context of, as you well know, that during certain parts of this country's development and growth in uh, the, the early 20th century, they were pretty much the economic engine and the engine, literally the grease, greasing the engines of becoming the capitalist powerhouse that we are today. And you were talking about the amount of damage that they've done knowingly. Um, we learned that cigarettes at some point in time, like when they first started smoking cigarettes, the tobacco farmers didn't already know and continue to ignore the damage that was done. But at some point in time, it was made evident and they tried to hide it. Please explain to my colleagues when they actually went from being, you know, the economic powerhouse to the villains that we described them as today. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that question, because I, because I think it's a it's a very good question to ask. And I, and I think the answer to that question is when to the point when they realized that what they were doing was damaging the war, earth, which is in about the mid 1970s, somewhere between 1973 and 76. They they had figured out maybe a little bit earlier, they had figured out what they were doing and they hit it. And that, there therein lies the problem. Once they figured it out, they hit it because they wanted profits. And that's the difference. And I think that and, what you're saying from before that is absolutely true. Like they built this country. We this is what World War II was built on. This is what defeated Hitler. And this is what defeated the Japanese. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. They were not the villains then, they were the heroes then. But the moment that they realized what they were doing, and they kept doing it and they hit it from public. Same thing with this with the and, tobacco. And as we've had to do with the tobacco industry. I would ask this because I know you and some people think you're an environmental nut job. I'm, I know you're not. I'm sorry. You're my buddy. I'm not going to cut it. But I also know you have logic behind, you know, what you're talking about. So I would ask that you provide some of that detail to my colleagues, because when you guys describe the coal, the, the, the oil industry, it's from a very vehement point of view. And there needs to be some rationale besides they knew. Like, you know, everybody says they knew, but no, specifically what you're with some specificity, I, that would be nice if you could provide that to my committee so they would at least understand your mindset and the mindset of those that testified in favor of this bill. OK, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for making that point, because I think you've illuminated it for me and I will make sure I get you the, your committee members the scientific data once they first became aware and when they started hiding it. Because that makes a big that. difference, doesn't it? It was yeah, hard to defend the tobacco right. industry once we saw the notes and the memos of them knowing not only was it addictive, but it was deadly. And then they went out of the way to make it more addictive because I feel bad when I hear you guys talk sometimes. I'm like, listen, if you drive a truck today, you're a villain because we still consume all of this. We don't get to say it's not our fault because there are options and we choose not to take them because and some can't afford to take them. And as you and I have talked about this bill before, when you say there's no flow through, I mean, maybe people on the panel believe that, but anybody who doesn't trust government, which is most people, myself included, don't see how we're ever going to really make that happen. And how somehow it's not going to trickle back down to those who make 30 and $40,000 a year as a family and need one, if not two cars to get back to their menial live jobs. So all I want to know, is, I want to make sure we understand the villainization, obviously, but also I've talked to you about this, the inherent distrust that we don't, that we'll take care of you. Don't, it might look like it's going to cost a lot, but it won't. Those are the things that I think that people always get caught up on because whenever the government says, don't worry, we got you. Yeah. I, everybody starts getting real nervous and it's not just an R and D thing. It's a people thing. So I appreciate right. your presentation. I know we have two more questions. Is that so? uh, 
would would you say jay isn't that so isn't that so yes. mr chairman thank you mr chairman if if i may just say thank you for bringing that up and i would be elated to work with you uh on, on this bill in the future um, thank you buddy I, I appreciate you talking about i don't about being very logical and pragmatic about this and realistic about it, just trying to do the right thing for, for Marylanders. Thank you. Thank you, bud. All right, uh, Do Johnny Mouts. Yeah, I just want to try this a question again with the latest witnesses. Can anybody tell me how you would assess a fee for an out-of-state energy company that's sell selling energy in Maryland if this is enacted? How, how would that work? I, I know, Mr. Chairman, we, we may have missed a couple of witnesses. I don't know if they were on your witness list, but uh, Josh Kaufman-Faber was a climate change person, and I know he didn't get called, but I don't know if he was a subset, but I think he is very well suited. I mean, I can give you the, you know, the basics of $15 a ton or $60 well, I'll, I'll be honest with you, brother, you're, you're putting our committee through the ringer with all these witnesses you have signed up. I do not see this gentleman as a. Um, That's okay. That's okay, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate it. I can follow up with you, uh, delegate delegate mounts, um, off, offline. Uh, other than what's in the bill, but I'm happy to follow up with you in detail offline. I, I don't want to take more of the committee's yeah. time. I appreciate it. I, I could probably give a quick answer if you'd like. Oh, sure. he, he made it open ended. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay. Um, uh, just really quickly, that the reason you can um, apply it is because it's on the sales and the use. And so that makes you able to, uh, so it's the business they're doing in Maryland. Um, so that uh, any company that does business, you can tax them for their business uses in that state. How, yeah, but how would you specifically be able to identify the producer? I mean, there's no direct link. It doesn't go from one place to the, to another place. How would you, how would the state of Maryland do that? And and do we have other, I mean, is there any other example of where that occurs? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it really wouldn't be significantly different than gasoline taxes and many other taxes, cigarette taxes that exist right now. So it gets divided back on the back end of that amongst so the, consumer, the different users. On the, consumer. the point of sale, delegate amounts, it would be the point of sale from yeah. the point that it comes into the state of Maryland and it's sold to distributors. That's when it would be, that's when we would collect. Yeah, but, the, but then, and this is a real question. I'm not trying to. I know you had a, a pretty tough day with this bill, but um, but the bill was presented that there was a hold harmless, so that it wouldn't it wouldn't affect the consumer. But now you're telling me the way this actually works is it's a sales tax, so that does affect the consumer. In fact, the sales tax is a regressive tax, right? Um, I, I don't know, I, but let's talk about it offline. Yeah, you know, I, I'm happy to talk to talk, talk with you offline about it, I, and I'm happy to answer this question. But in the interest of of time for your committee, um, I've answered it in the previous years, and we can talk offline about it. But I do have a direct answer for you because because it's supposed to purport to help, but I think if you look at the way it, if you look at the way it works, it may actually hurt or burden. The, the people it's supposed to help. If you look at the specifics, I, right. I could be wrong. I, I would say, I would say, know, delegate, so. per, the, per what the chairman said, there is a no pass through clause, but there's a backup, and that 50% of these revenues are paid back to people in a, a lower socioeconomic echelon. So, but I, I can talk with you uh, offline about the details of that, but those are the two safeties that are built into the bill. The number one part is making sure that people that are um, in lower socioeconomic echelons aren't, aren't, are, are held, are specifically held. Harmless. Those two big pieces of the bill, but I can talk with you offline. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for 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 taking a shot at that for me. Thank you, John or Delegate Mouts. Um, Mr. Stream. <laughs> that would be Delegate Aaron. Sorry, Delegate Aaron. I, I didn't change it. I apologize. <laughs> you know, I, I just want to bring something to what was said a, a few minutes ago. I think it's pretty odd that we rely well over eighty five percent of our energy is coming from these villains. And I appreciate that we call them villains, but we're still using them. And my whole pretense on talking about this bill is it's disingenuous to say that we are going to make them pay for this because that will never happen. You and I will pay for it. And it's also a little bit hard for people to tell me how terrible something is that they're using. And they know they're stuck with it because we do not have the ability. And one of the biggest things we should be doing is looking at the best way to find out how we accomplish this with the least harm to the ratepayers. This bill, if enacted, 
will double bubble hit that hit that number. We'll still be paying the, the, the money for the recs because we can't produce it. And then we'll be doubling because we'll now be charging it on the other side of it money for this fossil fuel that we're all using. And I just think those are the things we need to focus on, not, not the fact that we want to go to renewable or not. It's just how we're, we're building a business doubling down on the backs of the people that are using that 85%. Isn't that so? That's so. Thank you very much. And we next have Delegate Pippi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess this is a question for my uh, my good friend, uh, Delegate Frazier, uh, Delegate Frazier. How are you? I am well, sir. How are you? Good. Hey, so um, I'll just start with a quick quote, then a quick question. So, you know, 100 years ago, if you owned a horse but also had a car, you were rich. And now, you know, if we have cars and then you happen to own some horses, you'd, you'd be considered rich. And I, and I bring that up because it, times have changed and people are always seeking for affordable energy. We get a lot of bills in this committee on, on what we can do to. It's all about the horsepower. Is that what you're saying? Right. Well, we get a lot of legislation of what we can do to make energy more affordable, um, which is a real issue. And anyone who's following, you know, inflation and gas prices right now, um, it's, it's a big deal because people, right. most Americans are on fixed income. And when price percent, you know, they, they essentially can't afford, you know, to live. So it really comes down to, has the carbon footprint of people changed? I mean, have we, are we worse? Are people worse to the environment than they were before? Uh, and, and there's, there's a question coming here. Um, I mean, is the issue people? Are we consuming more per person? Because every person that's testifying in favor of this bill has benefited from inexpensive energy. I mean, every article of clothing they're wearing, every vehicle they drove here was either manufactured with the help of, of fossil fuels, uh, even their electric cars. I mean, we're, we're all guilty. You know, we're all in on it. So, I mean, is the issue that we are producing more problems for the environment? Do we just need less people or are we actually becoming more environmentally friendly? Um, you know the answer to that? So I think that's a very, very complicated um, answer. I would first say by, I would say that implementing this bill or some version of this bill would be, you know, some of the first steps that are necessary to remove or reduce our addiction to oil. If you look what's going on right now with Russia, and if you look what's going on around the world, one of the issues we have with that war is everybody's afraid to turn off the oil because we're addicted to it. So this is just the first steps to your point to try to reduce that, try to reduce the burning of fossil fuels. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. But the sooner we start, the better. And we are making we are making progress. I mean, it's a very complicated answer. And you have multiple questions in there. And in the interest of the of the chairman and the committee's time, I'm happy to talk with you offline about it. But this is the first step in reduction. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, do believe uh, the delegate Ants is not, your hand is not no longer up, correct? I got you, understand. Technology, all that. Uh, now we have uh, Jay Walker, Delegate Pippi, you are done too, correct? Thank you. Delegate Jay Walker. Uh, this is my annual tradition. I'm trying to remember. Mr. Chairman, uh, what type of car do you drive? I drive an electric car, sir. Okay. So I'm not a consumer. Yeah, just for your for, for your edification, Delegate Walker, I drive an electric car as well. Yes, so we're not villains. But <laughs> I want to thank everybody for uh, the, uh, the the debate today. Um, Delegate Frazier Rodago, I know you bring this bill every year with the best of intentions. For those folks that were um, that weathered the storm we call Delegate Mark Fisher, I appreciate that. He has his best intentions. He has a, um, please understand, everybody here has a constituency to represent. And everybody does their best to represent them. So if they disagree, if it sounds like they're being you know, rough with you. That's either their personality or their job and most likely both. So thank you guys very much for participating. We will now move on to the next bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Brooks, House Bill 1112. Okay. Alrighty, Chair Wilson, Vice Chair Crosby and my members of my committee. And thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of HB 1112, that's electricity, net energy metering, generation credits. Uh, for the record, I'm Delegate Brooks, I represent the 10th Legislative District in, uh, in Baltimore County. Uh, the, the purpose of this bill is to provide uniformity 
in the application of net metering credits. Currently, there's no uniform approach to the application of net metering credits. One electric company prepares a biometric credit and applies a credit against the total ratepayers' consumption. Other companies convert the, the metered <clears throat> on-site generation into monetary credits and subtract it from the customer's bill. Biometric credits are an antiquated net metering concept. They are difficult for customers to understand uh, in, 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 this, in the application. It is unclear what the value of a kilowatt hour is to a customer. On the other hand, converting the biometric credit to a monetary credit provides customers with more transparency as to how the electric company is calculating their respective amount due. For example, it is more difficult for someone to understand the value of 100 kW in credits compared to $10 in credits. Furthermore, Maryland electric companies apply net metering credits to customers' bills differently. This is not problematic for the majority of customers who do not subscribe to budget billing and receive their amount due on a monthly basis. But as a result, most customers realize their net metering credits immediately on their monthly bills, as was the natural intent of the program. However, this is not the case for state budget billing customers. Customers enrolled in budget billing in some electric company territories see their net energy metering credits applied to the budget billing balance and not the amount of the due on their monthly bill. The result is that the customer is paying their full budget billing amount and also their monthly subscription to the community solar subscriber organizations each month. The net result is double billing for such customers, and they do not receive their project savings until the electric company trues up their budget billing balances, which could be several months. When customer generators install their renewable power generation generators, there is both an upfront setup cost and the ex expectation of immediate savings in their monthly electric bill. But the current policy of electric companies does not allow the net energy credits to be applied to their monthly bill, preventing customers from quickly re recouping the cost of implementation for, from seeing their savings on the generation of their renewable power. HB112 attempts to remedy these issues by converting the net energy meeting in, metering into monthly credits and applying this full monetary credit against the monthly total due on the customer's bill. The Clean Energy Job Act, that's CJA, set a 50% renewable energy by 2030. HB 112 incentivizes, not paralyzes ratepayers to use renewable energy sources, thus getting Maryland one step closer to the 2030 goal. While adjusting the billings process might be difficult for electric companies, we can see how this policy discourages customers from setting up their own renewable power generators. With decarbonization as a, as a top priority for the energy grid, we must maximize our green energy productions whenever possible. HB1112 ensures that customer generators will realize the immediate savings of going green and hopefully encourage other Maryland residents to do the same. Uh, for that reason, Mr. Chair, I request a favorable report and I'll entertain any questions. I do have two oral testimonies, uh, sir, uh, James Feinstein and John Fiastro. So we can perhaps have their testimonies and then we can go to the questions, sir. John Fiastro. Thank you, Chair Wilson. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Mr. Feinstein from Arcadia to go first, if that's all right. That's fine. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm James Feinstein. I'm an active participant in the Public Service Commission's RM56 Working Group, which is actively working to improve the Community Solar Program. And I'm also the Policy and Regulatory Lead for Arcadia. Arcadia is actively managing more than 57 megawatts across 28 projects in Maryland today, and more than 500 megawatts of community solar nationwide. And that makes us the largest community solar subscriber manager in the country. Um, I'm excited to speak with you all today about this important legislation. Um, in short, uh, HB 1112 has two key components. The first, as Delegate Brooks mentioned, uh, requires that 
community solar credits be applied in a way that customers uh, easily understand, which is in a dollar value or a monetary credit. And today, three of the four utilities already do this. So it's as simply that portion of the bill just requires the fourth utility to do so as well. The second portion of the bill focuses on making sure community solar interacts well with budget billing. Um, today, if a customer is enrolled in both community solar and budget billing at the same time, they tend to have a poor experience. So the simple fix for that is just to make sure that the customer receives their community solar credits on a monthly basis, uh, again, and applied to their monthly amount due uh, and not applied to that underlying budget billing balance. So this bill would do both those things. It would require monetary credits for all community solar for all community solar projects and subscribers, and it would require that the community solar credits get applied to the monthly amount due. Um, uh, with that, I'll conclude my testimony, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. All right, um, we have Drew McCullough here just for information, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Fia John Fiastro. Yeah, did you want to testify? Um, Yes, Mr. Chairman, I just had a few comments to make. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the members of the committee, John Fiastro, on behalf of Arcadia, I want to say thank you first to the sponsor for working with us on this bill. This bill is a product of about 18 months worth of work, dialogue with utilities, dialogue with the sponsor, and uh, we think we have a good product, especially with the amendment before the committee to consider. So first we wanna thank the, the, the chairman for that. We think the amendment answers a few of the concerns that members might see in the testimony, particularly lifting the language from the uh, subsection, excuse me, section 7306, which deals specifically with net metering and moving it and isolating the language to the community solar portion uh, section of the public utility article 7306.2. We think that answers most of the uh, most of, if not all of the testimony concerns that, that members might see in the file. We think this is a, uh, discreet, uh, uh, discreet change. We think that it's important. Uh, and we think it's important because here we are in the middle of the community solar pilot. We think there's an overall benefit to making sure that the pilot is perf uh, perfected or, or at least very much improved upon, uh, as we move the, towards that improvement members of this committee and the General Assembly can consider permanent status of, uh, of community solar within the state. So we think this is a necessary change in advance of that. And uh, we thank the committee for its time and we urge a favorable report with the amendment offered by Delegate Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you very much. Uh, Drew McAuliffe, I see you here as uh, information. Okay, well, that concludes this hearing. One of the next hearing uh, is now Delegate Queen, 1261. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, Delegate Pam Queen, I'm presenting HB 1261, the Community Solar Energy Generation System Pilot Program Alterations. So greetings, Chair Wilson, Vice Chair Crosby, and members of the Economic Matters Committee. Uh, while the Community Solar Energy uh, Generating System Pilot Program is underway, HB 1261 proposes the consideration of a cross-utility crediting program that allows uh, community solar customers in one electric utility service territory to subscribe to a community solar rate in another electric utility service territory. Uh, the community solar customer will enjoy credits to their bills with credits exchanged across the utility service territories. The benefits of a cross-utility crediting um, is greater efficiency as it's implemented as if it's one community solar program versus multiple silo programs. It facilitates connecting consumer solar supply to customer demand with less customer concerned about the limitations of a given array in their community, but rather enabling the consumer to benefit from energy credits while supporting statewide renewable energy initiatives. This is a win-win for the consumer as well as the state. So why should we implement this now? Because during the pilot, we can evaluate the feasibility, test logistics, detect efficiencies, and highlight rulemaking um, requirement by the PSC before a large-scale implementation. So as crafted, HB 1261 does not increase consumer 
community solar capacity caps per electric utility service territory, nor requires a hosting uh, electric utility to transfer electricity from one community solar rate to another uh, electric array, a uh, utility. That's some of the confusion that's been uh, discussed about this bill. But I think this is a, a good uh, thing for us to look at. I seek a favorable recommendation for HB 1261 as an alteration to allow cross utility crediting to Maryland's community solar energy generation system pilot program. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll go to John Fiastro. Mr. Vice Chair, I'm gonna hand it off to Mr. Feinstein first, if that's all right with you. Okay, Mr. Feinstein. Yep, thank you, Chair Wilson, Vice Chair Crosby, and uh, sponsor Delegate Queen. Um, yeah, I'm James Feinstein, I'll spare you all a repeat of my introduction, uh, but again, I'm with Arcadia. Um, as Delegate Queen mentioned, uh, this bill uh, solves an existing problem in the community solar market. As the program exists today, uh, there are these geographic barriers drawn along utility boundaries that limit which projects any household in Maryland can subscribe to. So this legislation would simply lift that barrier and allow any household in the state to subscribe to a community solar project, regardless of where they're located. Um, we think this is a, a good program efficiency improvement for the program. Uh, I also wanna clarify that this does not mean new transmission lines need to be built, does not change existing caps that are put on each utility territory for how much community solar they can develop. Those are already set by the commission. This bill is simply an accounting practice and allows, again, customers to receive credits from a project located in a different service utility territory. Um, and with that, I'll yield my remarks um, and I urge a favorable report of this bill and look forward to any questions. John Fiastro. Thank you, Vice Chair Crosby, members of the committee. On behalf of Arcadia, John Fiastro, thank you to the sponsor for putting the bill in. Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, I wanna mention and reiterate a few things Things that the bill does not do and who does those functions currently. So the bill does not change any capacity caps for utility territories for community solar. The PSC sets those caps via regs and this bill honors those caps. It does not intend for a hosting electric utility to transmit electricity from one community solar to array to another electric utility. And we might hear some testimony a little bit later on saying, I don't know how we're going to do this. Well, this bill doesn't require that. It simply is, as Mr. Uh, Feinstein said earlier, this is an accounting bill, how we move monetary credits from customer A, from array uh, in utility A to customer in utility B. So I want to address a few of the items that are brought up in the testimony, uh, in the opposition testimony. There's a concern about how the monetary credit, the credits will be uh, normalized from one service territory to another. And the fact of the matter is, is that the community subscriber, solar subscriber organization can right size subscriptions in order to make sure that the monetary credits that the customer enjoys are appropriately sized. That is to say, we can work out mechanisms. We do not have to worry necessarily about a discrepancy of a tariff within utility A and a tariff in utility B. So there are ways that we can make sure that there are there is a proper treatment and so that there is no cross subsidization of one set of ratepayers for another. That's not what this bill does. And that can be hammered out in the rulemaking process uh, that, we are, that, that we could consider at the commission. So I know that I'm short on time. I'm here for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. Thank you. We'll go to the unfavorable. First, we have Katie Lazenrado. Sorry if I... That's okay, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair Crosby, and members of the House Economic Matters Committee. My name is Katie Lanzarato here on behalf of Pepco and Delmarva Power. Uh, with me today is Dave Schatz, our Director of Strategy for PHI, and he's here at my request. He's not a registered lobbyist, uh, but can answer any questions you may have for our company. You have a written testimony, but I'll add that currently PHI does not have access to the meter data of a, of a community solar project's energy production that's located outside of our service territory, which is needed to fulfill the intent of this bill. As a result, PHI would not be able to determine a community solar subscriber's allocated share and credit them accordingly. I'd also like to note that the cost of providing service to customers varies across Maryland. 
under this bill, a community solar project that's built in Delmarva Power Service area could have a customer or subscriber that's in First Energy Service Territory. However, the energy generation, capacity, transmission, and distribution charges in Delmarva Power Service area and First Energy Service area are different. The First Energy customer or subscriber may get a higher value offset than the value of that energy, generation, capacity, transmission, and distribution charges in the First Energy Service Territory. The practical result is a cross-subsidization between customers from different utilities that will impact any non-customer or non-subscriber in another utility service territory. TEPCO and Delmarva Power support community solar as an opportunity for customers to benefit from solar energy. However, the bill is structured in a way that makes it challenging to bring the equitable benefits of community solar to customers in Maryland. Therefore, we respectfully request an unfavorable report on the bill. Thank you, Dave Schatz. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'm just here for questions as a subject matter expert along with Ms. Lentera. Perfect. Thank you, Allison Black. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the committee. I am Allison Black here on behalf of BGE. Also testifying with me is Mr. Devesh Gupta. He is the Director of Strategy for BGE. Mr. Gupta is not a registered lobbyist, but he's testifying on this bill at my request. He's also here to answer any questions that you all may have. BGE is in respectful opposition to 1261, to House Bill 1261. BGE, BGE is supportive of com the community solar uh, program. And if it moves to full implementation, we believe we can create more community solar opportunities, particularly for our limited income customers. However, this bill comes at a time when Maryland is in the fifth year of the seven year community solar pilot program. The bill would require that BGE and other Maryland electric utilities develop and submit to the PSC protocols for, provi for providing credits across service territories by November 1st of this year. This is no small effort and it's important to recognize that there are practical implementation challenges presented by this legislation. The bill could also create cross-subsidization, which is a challenge that's, that was considered by the General Assembly during discussions surrounding the original community solar proposal. This is why the existing pilot program requires that the sub subscriber share a territory with the facility. So the aggressive timeline to implement such a significant and complex change to the current pilot program is not feasible for BGE. And we don't think it's prudent to approach it at such a late point within the pilot program. Rather than rush to make this change and disrupt the current pilot program, BGE agrees with the Public Service Commission's recommendation to conduct a comprehensive review of these issues to cons for consideration following implementation of the pilot program in two years. The technical challenges and system upgrades needed to implement this concept, concept would take time to navigate and would come at cost at the cost to our customers. And for these reasons, we oppose House Bill 1261, and we would respectfully recommend we consider these ideas as we evaluate the outcomes of the Community Solar Pilot Program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is Mr. Gupta going to testify, Allison? Yes, he is. Okay, Devish Gupta. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today about HB 1261. To start, BG continues to see significant growth and adoption of community solar through its current pilot program. In 2021, the program increased to over 34 megawatts of solar generation, supplying over 4,000 customers through 25 projects. BG provided bill credits for 31,000 megawatt hours at a value of over $3.6 million to those customers in 2021. 2022 could see those project and customer numbers more than double. The program continues to grow and serve customers without the challenging revisions required under the bill. BG is particularly concerned that the bill would require utilities to develop expensive systems and processes during only a pilot program period in order to transfer monthly electric bill credits to a community solar customer's bill, regardless of whether the solar is located in the same utility territory as the customer. Accounting for differences between territories represents a complex challenge that would require time to consider and solve. In addition, stakeholders must have time to examine net metering in one utility's territory, subsidized by ratepayers in that utility's territory, while system and environmental benefits of the solar project, if any, are gained by a different utility. Again, all of this, if feasible, would take substantial time to develop and implement. Instead of the compressed time frame set out in the bill, review of these issues would be more appropriate for consideration once the community solar pilot report is delivered to the General Assembly at the conclusion of the pilot in just over two years. For the reasons stated above, 
BGE respectfully requests an unfavorable report for House Bill 1261. Thank you, Delegate Meltz. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, witnesses. Good to see you. Uh, Katie, you were referring um, to the, um, the problems with um, a different provider. So on, in our district, and we've had this before, we, you've got Chop Tank and DPNL on both sides of the road, right? Um, explain to me again what, how that would work. So if, 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 if this facility, if one, if one community solar was in the Chop Tank area, um, how would that impact DPNL? I might defer to, to my colleague Dave on this one to give you a more comprehensive answer. Yeah, how would it affect it? Then how would that be? What, what, and then the resolution that's being contemplated, um, can you explain that a little bit? That would be helpful. Yes, that, uh, thanks for the question, Delegate. I think, um, so the community solar pilot program was designed so that uh, facilities, the community solar facilities could only serve subscribers within the same service territory. And that's because uh, just as Mr. Gupta noted, the benefits of that solar system and the costs of that solar system are designed within a tariff and within that service territory. So you have two different service territories. Those are two different costs and benefits of that array. And therefore there could be an inconsistency between the tariffs in one service territory or another. Gotcha. So um, that's why this, this would take a lot of uh, discussion in the Public Service Commission setting. Um, I think in a working group setting, a lot of this could be uh, worked out, but it does take a lot of complex planning in order to address those inconsistencies between the tariffs of two service territories. And we don't have a connection um, in our billing and crediting uh, to that end. Okay, well, thank, thank you, thank you. Uh, John Fiastro, did you want to comment? Yeah, and uh, Delegate Mounts, uh, James, James Fe uh, Feinstein might have some responses to this as well, but I would suggest that I think that we're overthinking this if we're thinking that we're going to be transmitting uh, electricity from one side of the street, a chop tank side of the street to a DPL side of the street. The idea is that the management of this concept would be strolling from a accounting uh, would, would, would be solely from an accounting principle. So it'd be the exchange of dollars and not the exchange of electricity over, over, uh, over utility lines. And so that's a, that's a key difference. And I, and, you know, I appreciate the utilities concerns. I think they've read a little bit more into this bill than this bill really means and intends because it really is at its heart, an accounting bill, an accounting bill. It's not an electrical engineering bill. It's not an electricity management bill. It is an accounting bill. Okay, so I think that's the first the first thing, and uh, uh, that that members of the committee can remember uh, should keep in mind. And uh, I don't know if Mr. Feinstein has a comment on, on this. Well, that that answers my question. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Delegate Queen. I saw your hand went up and then went down. Do you have a question? I do. I think I'll let everybody else talk. I just okay. have a question uh, okay. with all the utilities so that they end. Okay. Delegate Howard. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. One of the things I'm concerned about is as we increase uh, solar generating in the state, um, that, that some of these uh, areas that would uh, service this increase would be rural areas and on top of that, um, agro land. And um, Mr. Fiastro, you talked about this just being a revenue. Um, this is really just about dollars. Uh, if, if, if this legislation were to move forward and the committee, if it's so desired, um, developed an amendment or an individual developed an amendment to ensure that was the case, would your, you and your organization support that amendment and that initiative? Uh, you know, I'd have to defer uh, uh, to Mr. Feinstein on that. I would, I would say that this bill has less to do about capacity limits for service territories uh, I would say that this bill is really about accounting um, and, and how customers can be billed. Uh, the capacity limits per each service territory for each utility is set by the Public Service Commission through a regulatory proceeding. It's an ongoing regulatory proceeding throughout the, throughout the course of the pilot. And really, that's something that should be kept in mind here. And, and, and BGE and Delmarva Power and Light and PEPCO all have representatives on the 
on the Public Service Commission's net metering working group. They participate, they comment, they engage in the pilot process and the rulemaking process on a regular basis. So, so I, you know, I, I'm going to pivot here a little bit and suggest that, you know, this notion that we're going to start all of this from scratch and we're in a pilot and let's set it and forget it. The pilot is and has been from its very beginning an ongoing creature. In fact, just this last month, uh, regulations for community solar came into effect and the commission, upon its adoption of those regulations, uh, said, hey, we're going to keep on working on this. Uh, and there were some matters that they're going to, they've committed to keep on working on. So, um, you know, I think to your, to your first question, the capacity limits are set by the commission and the net metering working group is well suited. All the players in, are engaged and we can take this up uh, as a matter of work in front of the, uh, in front of the commission coming up soon. I understand what you're saying, but you know, as well as I do, there's a lot of cross threading on these bills and these bills work in tandem. So uh, I just, you know, I want to bring it to everybody's attention while it's being, you know, hey, it's uh, this is just more about accounting or, you know, well, we can't get one without the other, so to speak. And uh, there is a bill uh, to increase capacity. And, um, you know, you would need you would need this piece of legislation for exactly the stated purpose that you just gave, which would be um, the accounting purposes. So I appreciate it, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you. Oh, Queen, did you want to go ahead and ask a question now? That's it. Okay, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, the Vice Chairman. I just want to try to clarify what some of the concerns are for the uh, utilities. Is it concerned that the, the November date is uh, too soon or that we shouldn't be addressing this sort of, um, you know, cross utility issue? Because, you know, we do have service areas of BG, Pepco, we talked about Del Marvel. Delmarva as well as Chop Tank, we have that sort of issue that could come up that we would need to address this issue at some point. And I'm just trying to get a sense of what do you think is the, at the end of the pilot, once we're looking at going full blown to try to address it then, I'm just trying to get a better sense of, of your concerns. Do you think we don't need to address this ever or it's just a timing thing? That makes sense. I'll, I'll start and then I'll ask um, my colleague, uh, Mr. Gupta, to, to respond as well. Um, but the, the time frame is, is a concern. Um, mm -hmm. It is suggesting that we look at, at providing protocol and, and implement, implementation plan by November 1st of, of this year. So the pilot program is in its fifth year. It only has two more years to go. And it's asking the, the utilities and the Public Service Commission to um, pursue something that we believe would be very complex. And in terms of going across service territories, that's something that um, would, would create a lot of, um, would be necessary, would create the need to do a lot of in, in intelligence in terms of technical um, aspects for the, for the utilities. And so, the time frame is certainly a, a concern. The Public Service Commission has has expressed concern regarding the time frame. So mm -hmm. our 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 thought is that yes, um, let the pilot um, run its course, let the pilot come conclude, and when the Public Service Commission is reviewing uh, the pilot mm -hmm. in terms of whether or not the state should move into full implementation, this can be assessed during that process. But to do it at this late time frame. Um, and to try to rush this into uh, the pilot pr program, we think is um, just infeasible uh, at this time. And so I'll, I'll ask uh, Mr. DeGupta to add, add to anything to that. Thank you, Allison. Just, just a couple of comments I would add. I, I think I mentioned right now, the program is robust in terms of how many applications we're getting from developers to put in solar to serve customers through community mm -hmm. solar. So that that issue's not there in terms of having a queue of projects that customers will eventually be able to subscribe to if and when those projects uh, are energized. Um, the other issue on timing that I would point out is that if we're talking about a timeline where let's say everything goes perfectly uh, and we're able to design systems to, to spend the dollars, to invest in the, in the electronic systems, to be able to, uh, to manage those credits and, and that accounting that we're talking about, which is going to take an investment of dollars, 
At best, you're thinking about this program launching in the spring of next year to allow for this additional, these additional parties to be able to participate across utility lines. Well, okay, you start to think about how long does it take to site, construct a solar project from there, and then at what point are customers going to be able to start taking advantage of it during the pilot program? You're talking about possibly maybe a year of time or less that a customer is even able to take advantage of that program or that new program enhancement for an investment that we had to spend significant dollars in order to achieve. And mind you, I don't even know how much it's going to cost to implement this, this complicated solution. Uh, so it's not to say that it's not something that may not be an enhancement that the commission recommends or that the working group recommends as, as a, uh, an, a way that the program should be enhanced when it's no longer a pilot, but it is something that we should be thinking very careful about in this pilot period, spending dollars on doing when there's not that much time left. Queen. All right, that concludes the hearing for House Bill 1261. We'll now go on to Delegate Lewis. I see joined us in, uh, House Bill 1271. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, thank you, esteemed colleagues of the Economic Matters Committee. Delegate Robin Lewis here on behalf of House Bill 1271 entitled Public Utilities Homeowner Utility Repair Fund Establishment. House Bill 1271 is designed to make it easier for low and middle income Marylanders to pay for home maintenance, uh, uh, utility repairs and upgrades. So if you can imagine of what's happening in Baltimore City right now for a variety of reasons, Homeowners in Baltimore are, are required to have upgraded gas lines installed in their homes. This installation requires a fair amount of demolition and disruption and cost. Uh, this bill, House Bill 1271, will tap into unused weatherization and energy assistance funds that are already sitting out there and will enable the state to make those funds available through grants to folks who need them to do things like cover the costs of these BGE gas line upgrades. Um, that's really it. I'll mention that this bill is cross-filed in the Senate with Senator Bill Ferguson as the Senate sponsor, Senate Bill 770. And with that, I will ask your favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. And I don't see anyone signed up uh, or, or opposed. So that concludes the hearing for House Bill 1271. Thank you. Next, we'll go to House Bill 1083, Delegate Carr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good afternoon, distinguished colleagues of the Kind and Gentle Economic Matters Committee. Before I start, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to ask if it would be okay to substitute a witness for the town of Kensington for another witness from the town of Kensington on my panel. Delegate, tip it. Okay, if it's your panel, I'll allow it. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. For the record, I'm Delegate Al Carr, and uh, I'm here to present House Bill 1083, the County and Municipal Street Lighting Investment Act. This is enabling legislation that is designed to dramatically speed up investments in energy efficient street lighting. There is a sponsor amendment in your packet that incorporates input from the staff of the Public Service Commission and zeroes out a $245,000 item in the fiscal note. The bill requires each electric company to file a tariff with the Maryland Public Service Commission for customer owned streetlights. It, establish, it establishes a predictable and fair method for determining the value of utility owned lights and it provides a mechanism for the Public Service Commission to resolve any acquisition or valuation disputes. As mentioned in a 2020 Maryland Energy Administration report, upgrade, upgrading streetlights to the latest technology is happening too slowly in Maryland under the status quo. Maryland has fallen behind other states. For example, in the Pepco Service Territory in Prince George's and Montgomery counties, most of the 65,000 utility owned lights are still using 1970s technology. Only about 4% of those lights have been converted to durable, energy efficient 
LED or light emitting diode technology. House Bill 1083 is the fix that we need. By authorizing local governments to buy utility owned lights, they can partner directly with the private sector to expedite lighting upgrades. This enabling legislation provides a transparent and clear process for local governments exploring this type of upgrades. It's modeled after laws on the books in other states. This is an approach which is a best practice and it's worked well in California, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, Maine, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. It strengthens a law that the Maryland General Assembly enacted in 2007, but in the 15 years that have gone by, no Maryland county or municipality has successfully acquired utility-owned streetlights. Why? Well, first, utilities such as Pepco and Delmarva never filed tariffs with the Public Service Commission that allow for customer-owned lights. They do indicate that their planned filings this year will finally be in compliance. Second, each time a municipality inquires about buying overhead lights from the utility, there are disagreements about how to value the lights. This bill provides a fair way to resolve those disagreements. And third, utilities routinely invent new barriers. When a municipality in my district recently inquired about buying their lights, uh, the utility began demanding an upfront payment of third-party consulting fees for the privilege of obtaining an inventory of the 93 lights in their town. In the states that have passed laws like HB 1083, local governments are having success. For example, dozens of local governments in New York State successfully acquired utility-owned lights after their General Assembly enacted a similar law in 2015. Those cities and towns quickly began enjoying significant cost savings uh, for energy and maintenance, as well as improved safety. Upgrading streetlights to efficient LEDs should be the low-hanging fruit when it comes to reducing our carbon footprint, as well as improving pedestrian and traffic safety. Your favorable vote on this enabling legislation will have an immediate and direct positive impact. Thank you. Thank you, Delia Carr. Um, so I have Jimmy Charles. Did, did you have a panel? There's only three witnesses, and I know you wanted somebody for the town of Kensington. So is it okay if I just call them in the order I see them? Uh, sure, whatever order you like. Right. Alex Marini is in for the town of Kensington. All right, we'll, we'll take Jimmy Tarlow first. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair and members of the Economic Matters Committee. It's nice to see everybody. Uh, and congratulations, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I am here as the Vice Mayor of the City of Mount Rainier. Uh, we're a small municipality on the Prince George's County on the border of Washington, D.C. A uh, small fact is that we're the most densely populated city in the state of Maryland. Uh, I'm here uh, for the mayor and council of Mount Rainier to testify in support of this bill. Uh, we are an environmentally conscious, conscience uh, bill uh, city uh, trying to do what is right and also to save money. Uh, we proudly own over a hundred electric light poles right now, and we maintain them. And we've actually put LED uh, bulbs in each of our uh, lights. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Pepco has not done that on any of our lights. So our lights are actually more uh, modern and more environmentally uh, better than the Pepco lights. Unfortunately, these lights uh, have been there for over 50 years. Uh, and we would like to explore the possibility of purchasing more lights, both to save monies and also to make them more environmentally friendly. Unfortunately, the law that passed in 2007, which allows municipalities to own these lights has not been effective. My understanding is not one municipality in Maryland has been able to purchase their lights. Uh, DC has been able to purchase lights. Massachusetts, Rosa Rhode Island and Maryland have purchased uh, lights. This committee should seriously look at this bill in a favorable light and make it easier for local jurisdictions to purchase their own lights. Remember, this is only enabling legislation. I thank you and thank the committee for your time. I appreciate everything you guys do. Thank you. Thank Four you. Uh, we'll go to John Compton. Yes. Hello, um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity today to urge you to act favorably 
uh, on the County and Municipal Street Lighting Investment Act, which strengthens our op the options for municipalities in Maryland to own their own street light fixtures, such as Washington Grove, of which I'm the mayor. As you know, the town of Washington Grove is a small municipality in Montgomery County. Most of our town is on the National Register of Historic Places, and its lighting is included as a historic associated feature. So my testimony is, is uh, particularly important to a historic uh, community such as ours. Washington Grove we, does not own our street light fixtures and poles. They're currently owned by PEPCO. In cooperation with PEPCO um, and at the urging of Washington Grove, we have done several energy efficient conversions of our existing street lights that have helped reduce our lighting costs and improved our service. Had PEPCO's multi-year rate plan case from last year been successful, it is highly likely that both our historic lighting and the savings we've managed to develop over the years would have been in jeopardy. For most municipalities in the USA, their utility uh, cost is the highest of their costs, um, and it's the streetlights. From our research, we've seen, and as you heard from Delegate Carr, that municipalities around the country who have opted to purchase their own streetlights have saved a lot of money. I'm not suggesting it's an easy task or undertaking for any municipality, but the benefits are quite clear. Conversion of utility owned street lighting has been proven to improve service and to reduce costs. The existing options of ordered municipalities to acquire their own street lights from utilities have generated disagreement over costs and proved unworkable in practice. You've now heard that three times. That is an, an unquestionable fact. This new legislation will streamline the process for local governments interested in acquiring utility owned street lights and assuming uh, their own ownership and maintenance. The town of Washington Grove has worked cooperatively with PEPCO for many years. With the proposed new legislation, we're hopeful we can continue to work cooperatively with Mr. PEPCO. Compton, I'm gonna need you to start to wrap up, sir. I am, I'm wrapping up. And we'll be able to engage in fair negotiations for the ownership of our streetlights. The town's residents support passage and we hope you will um, act favorably on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Carr. Who, who was it, Allison from? It's uh, Alex Marini. Alex Marini. Hi, thank you so much. I am testifying on behalf of Bridget Hill Zayat. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the Economic Matters Committee. Uh, I'm the assistant to the town manager of the town of Kensington, uh, testifying on behalf of Bridget, who is a council member in the town of Kensington. And I am here today in support of House Bill 1083. As a small municipality, street lighting is our largest energy expense. Unfortunately, um, we currently have little control over this basic municipal service. For the 80% of lights in our town that are owned by PEPCO, we are currently overpaying for outdated, inefficient lights that require frequent maintenance. The limited upgrade options through PEPCO are also very expensive. PEPCO's 2020 proposal for a smart LED upgrade was rejected by the Maryland Public Service Commission because municipalities like Kensington objected to its inflexibility. Passage of House Bill 1083 will expand our options by allowing us to consider acquiring our lights from PEPCO. That way we can upgrade to energy efficient lights of our choice that match our historic town and select a maintenance provider of our choice as well. We expect to save money over the long term and increase pedestrian safety. Uh, and the town is already enjoying these benefits for the lights in our historic commercial area. Because we own them and they are behind a meter, we were not limited by PEPCO's tariff and we were able to upgrade them to LED years ago. Kensington was involved in the passage of the original 2007 law and we ask you to strengthen it by passing House Bill 1083. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Delegate Chi. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, the question is for the bill sponsor, Delegate, Delegate Carr. I quickly scanned uh, some of the opposition letters. Um, so there was an issue raised about fair market value, for example. What, what is your general take to the opposition by utilities? Yes, um, thank you, Delegate. So yeah, the, the utilities oppose this bill. Um, I actually think that their testimony proves the need for the bill um, because you can see in their testimony that there is this disagreement over the value. How do you put a value on the lights? And that is really the crux of this matter. By, and this bill will uh, resolve those issues by having a very predictable um, 
way to put a value on the light. I think that it benefits both parties to have that predictability. Uh, and we know from the other states that have done this, there are significant public benefits. And I don't, I don't believe the utilities in those other states have been harmed by um, you know, having an easier way for um, the local governments to acquire the lights. Uh, and it is enabling, so not every local government is interested in even going down this road, but uh, I think another benefit is that um, by uh, passing this bill, the utilities now, they have the threat that you know, they could um, be replaced. They'll have to compete. And if they're providing outstanding service at an outstanding value, then I don't think they have anything to worry about in terms of uh, a local government wanting to buy them out. Thank you. Okay, Delegate Fennell. Hey, it's good to see you, Delegate Carr. And Jimmy's hello, Jimmy Tallo. Um, Delegate Carr, my question is, um, what about the small mun municipality? Can they afford to um, purchase their own lights? Um, thank you, Delegate Fennell, for that great, great question. And I know you were uh, are the former mayor of a small municipality. Yes, I was former mayor, yes. And uh, I, I used to serve in the town of Kensington as a, as a council member. Uh, so the answer to your question is that this bill is enabling, so it doesn't require uh, municipalities to change anything. But one, a big benefit is that by providing certainty, it allows a small municipality or a large municipality to do the math. Uh, that way they can find out if it makes economic sense to purchase their lights or just to continue with what they're doing. Um, so right now they can't do the math because it is very difficult to determine what is the cost to acquire your lights and to upgrade them. Uh, also the, um, all right, that's, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Delegate Charcutian. Yeah, thank you. I seem to recall, um, I represent Tacoma Park amongst other areas, and I know they went through this process, and I know it was really tough and um, a really complicated process of acquiring the lights from Pepco uh, because they were fully committed. I think others since they went through it uh, have not succeeded. Do you happen to know, and I could also ask Pepco, but like how many, so so some, some municipalities have been successful, but I, do you know how many municipalities have been able to acquire the lights and pull this off? The Pepco is saying that they work with folks. Um, how many in the Pepco territory have, have managed to make this work? I think, um, do you know? Thank you, Delegate. Yeah, I'm, I am most familiar with the Pepco territory because that's the, uh, company that serves my district and, and your district. So I believe there are about 40 uh, municipalities in the Pepco service territory. And out of those 40, only two have successfully upgraded to LED. One is Tacoma Park, where you represent, and my understanding is that was, um, that took over a decade to, you know, get the tariffs it's upgraded, yeah, that's right. updated. Um, to select lights that were acceptable to the municipality. There was a lot of uncertainty about what the cost was gonna be. Even after they were installed, the city still wasn't getting a straight answer about what the cost was gonna be. They finally resolved that, then they had some issues with getting correct invoices and bills. Um, and they I did end up that, getting yeah. some empower money that did help subsidize and, they, and it ended up being a, a good deal for them. Uh, and then the city of Rockville came in later and said, can we get the same deal that Tacoma Park got? And they were told, no, that you can't get that good deal. So there's right now there's a system where uh, it's very hard to know if your municipality, what it's going to cost to upgrade to LED, whether you stick with Pepco or whether you go in a different direction. The other uh, municipality is called Martin's Additions. They're in my district. And uh, they paid a, a very large sum of money, about $3,000 per light. Um, to put in decorative LED lights. They had to hire a consultant to find some lights because the ones on Pepco's menu, you know, didn't really fit in their town. Um, so if you're a, a wealthy town that can, can hire consultants, you can, you can pull it off like Martin's Editions did, but um, for the other 38 towns, they haven't done that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reichert. Delegate Harrison. 
Thank you, um, Delegate Carr. And actually, that was kind of going to a, a question I was going to have. I have like three questions, though. Um, so if what happens if um, one of the municipalities decides that they want to purchase and then they end up purchasing and something happens that they can't afford anymore. What happens in that case? Um, thank you, Delegate, for that question. So um, uh, first of all, the bill's enabling, so municipalities don't have to go down this road, but if they do wanna go down this road, um, then they, would, uh, they could purchase the lights, they could hire a, a contractor of their choice to do the maintenance. Maintenance means changing the bulbs or if a pole gets knocked down to um, put the light back up on the pole. So we're talking about uh, the wood pole lights. So for, for, for this bill, the, the poles are owned by the utilities. We're only talking about the local government would only be acquiring the lights, not the, not the wood poles themselves. And um, local governments are already doing this for the metal pole lights, the ones that they own. There are uh, companies in the private sector that do this work, Maryland companies that will maintain um, lighting. And there's, system, there's a national system in place for pole knockdowns because there's all sorts of companies that attach to poles, uh, you know, cable company, Verizon, local governments. And so there's a system, you know, the owner of the pole puts the pole back up and then each of the tenants on the pole gets contacted so they can put their equipment back up. So we're, we're not inventing anything new. There have been procedures worked out for this um, uh, elsewhere that work just fine. And I, uh, what municipalities and other states have found is that they, they're saving a lot of money. They're gonna pay less in maintenance and less in energy if they go this route. So they would uh, hopefully have um, more money left over than if they just uh, went with the status quo. Um, and then um, does this affect HOAs at all? The HOAs, um, they're not considered a municipality or a government, but they are often responsible for everything that is within their um, uh, in their in in their in their in their HOA. <laughs> I was trying to find a fancy word, but I couldn't find it. Thank you, Delegate. So this bill only applies to lights that are owned by the utility and that are leased to the local government. Um, so like in Prince George's County, I think there's about uh, 20, 20 or 25,000 lights like this in the unincorporated part of the county um, in the PEPCO service territory. It, it wouldn't apply to lights that are are in which some other entity is paying for them, you know, other than the local government. Okay. And then, so you keep referring to PEPCO because I know that that's your area, but um, I personally have BG&E and I represent a lot, uh, you know, a, a good portion of my district has BG&E. Um, so have you had conversations with them um, on this matter? And I know that PEPCO has all of DC. So um, does DC, so I guess I had two questions, I'm sorry. DC, I guess they own theirs, is that correct? Um, yes, Delegate, that's correct. So in 1985, the District of Columbia reached an agreement with PEPCO to acquire all of the street lights. So as soon as you cross Eastern Avenue or Western Avenue into DC, all those lights that you see up on the wood poles, those are owned by the local government. Uh, and okay. so we just, we just wanna give Maryland jurisdictions that same uh, option and pay the same price that DC did when they acquired their lights. Well, that was 1985. That was a long time ago. I'm sure things have gone up since then. <laughs> I, I, I think that we would have to be fair in that manner because it's that's that's the right thing to do if this were to to, to happen. But um, so, have you had any conversations with the utility companies on this matter? Um, sure. So I do keep in correspondence um, with um, uh, Miss Lanzarato. Uh, at PEPCO, you know, we were just emailing earlier this uh, this week. You know, I did give them a heads up about this bill as soon as I had a draft back from uh, bill drafting in the summer. I did send them a, a you know advanced copy of it, so we we do keep in touch with it on it. Um, and I, you know, I'm, there are no surprises in terms of what their position is on the bill. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, and that concludes the hearing for House Bill. 
1083, we will now go to our final bill of the day, which is House Bill 1366. And I believe we have a member of the administration going to testify uh, on behalf of this bill. Uh. Hello, uh, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I'm Mary Beth Tung, Director of the Maryland Energy Administration, and I do hope I'm coming through okay here. Um, the way we consume and generate electricity is changing, and the major challenge in front of us is ensuring that all op options for decarbonization are considered, and that state encourages innovation. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about that during the hearing today uh, for the various bills. Uh, this will reduce costs to ratepayers while maintaining the reliability that is necessary for modern life. Maryland needs every emission reducing um, resource at our disposal. That means examining emerging, emerging technologies like advanced nuclear power hydrogen, or the reasons I'm here today, carbon capture utilization sequestration. Maryland is fortunate to have a considerable amount of in-state electricity generation, and some of these generation facilities are quite young. Therefore, as a state with our private sector partners, we have the opportunity to augment existing facilities with carbon capture technology. There is current successful technology already in place throughout the country and new technologies are always coming online. As a side note, there is fascinating emerging technology that uses combined cycle uh, with capture already built in and ready for transport and permanent storage, perfect for generation plants. However, for Maryland, retrofitting existing facilities may provide a cost saving in comparison to building new generation, and these facilities already have the transmission lines in place as they are providing dispatchable energy or peaking or base load demand. This bill signals support to the private sector in two ways. It provides a financial incentive through the Renewable Portfolio Standard, or RPS, and the latter part of the bill would provide a forum for key stakeholders in the state to engage on the important regulatory and legal hurdles as well as monitoring framework needed for the safe and permanent storage of carbon dioxide and underground formations. For these reasons, MEA has taken a favorable, is asking for a favorable report. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Ryan Opsel of our staff. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Thank you all for having me today. My name is uh, Ryan Opsel. I'm the Policy Director of the Maryland Energy Administration. Um, on the heels of what uh, Director Tung just mentioned, given our state's clean energy goals, it is really imperative that we expand carbon-free generation technologies used for in-state generation. So make our generation infrastructure more resilient, reliable, uh, instead of uh, relying more and more on generation from other states throughout PJM. Right now, uh, carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration technologies can make a difference. Costs for these technologies have come down a great deal, and there are several benefits to working with industry partners to retrofit the generation fleet. In particular, the capital costs for retrofit are less than the majority of other clean energy technologies on a kilowatt, I'm sorry, the majority of other clean energy technologies on a kilowatt basis, and developing a, a domestic carbon management economy will be necessary. To use another important technology, direct air capture, Direct air capture is a negative emissions technology that actually pulls carbon dioxide out of the air and readies it for transport and permanent storage. And it's becoming more economically viable, especially with new market entrants, including some based in, uh, here in Maryland. I wanna emphasize there is a market-based ecosystem that is being developed that can, can itself drive further cost-effective reductions in carbon emissions over time. Right now, the key subsidy mechanism for these projects comes from the federal government in the form of tax credits. Currently, these values are set at $50 per ton of CO2, uh, permanently sequestered as a result of bipartisan legislation with a bid in Congress to raise that to $85. In terms of storage, we actually have several potential storage sites in the state off the coast or in neighboring states that are Similarly, looking at their own geologic sequestration options, part of this effort uh, is to build a broader carbon-based economy, like using CO2 in the production of concrete. I'd also point out carbon capture is one of the best viable paths to decarbonize the industrial sector without forcing businesses to move out of Maryland. Overall, when choosing proper geology for storage, it is possible to properly prepare a site for permanent storage. Uh, and for these reasons, I will request a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we will go to now favorable with amendments, and that is Andrew Place. 
Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm Andrew Place, U.S. State Energy and Climate Policy Director at Clean Air Task Force and former Vice Chairman of Pennsylvania's Public Utility Commission. CATF supports the carbon capture study proposed in HB 1366, but has concerns with the inclusion of carbon capture in Tier 1 as written. State policy is to incentivize emerging clean technologies such as carbon capture, as well as other zero carbon technologies such as advanced nuclear and zero carbon fuels, for example, are critically important tools, but inclusion in a portfolio standard must be done with constraints as was done, for example, the inclusion of offshore wind. CATF supports the inclusion of carbon capture technology as a greenhouse gas emulsion Sorry, throw that again. CATF supports inclusion of carbon capture technology as a greenhouse gas emission reduction measure within Maryland's energy and climate strategy, as it supports the ability to reduce emissions from hard to abate industries, the expansion of clean firm power for the maintenance of grid stability, and is a key piece of a least cost, fully decarbonized electric system. State support for carbon capture and other emerging technologies are critical to the accessible growth and implementation of these technologies and for meeting the 2045 net zero greenhouse gas emissions goals as set out in HB 708. Additionally, CATF notes the importance of state leadership for developing regulatory considerations and identifying statutory impediments related to the adoption of carbon capture as noted. A robust regulatory and policy framework to support the deployment of carbon capture and provide appropriate guardrails must be developed in a coordinated fashion by appropriate and knowledgeable state entities. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Doug Fennell. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. My question is for Ryan. If you can't answer it now, you can just send the information to the office. I just wanted to know how many private partnerships you have and then how many um, are minority owned. If you don't have that information then you can just always email it or call me, okay? Absolutely, I'll go ahead and forward it to you. Thank you, I appreciate it, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay, we'll go to unfavorables. We have Lily Hawkins. Thank you, uh, members of the committee. I'm Lily Hawkins, Maryland organizer for Food and Water Watch. Uh, on behalf of our over 40,000 members in the state of Maryland, we urge you to oppose Governor Hogan's HB 1366. Despite decades of federal investment totaling billions of taxpayer dollars, carbon capture remains unproven with projects experiencing extensive delays, cost overages, and cancellations. Carbon capture is a false solution that props up dirty energy at the expense of the public. Infrastructure to support CCS is prone to leakage and poses numerous health and safety risks to nearby communities. Unproven schemes that store CO2 mean more groundwater contamination, air pollution, and even earthquakes. And uh, exposure to concentrated carbon dioxide if it leaks can be fatal. The recently released IPCC climate report predicts the worst impacts of climate change like severe food and water shortages if we don't tackle the climate crisis by transitioning off of fossil fuels immediately. The Hogan administration's proposal to promote carbon capture in Maryland does the complete opposite and instead fosters more fossil fuel use. We urge you to reject HB 1366 and make sure carbon capture doesn't make its way into any other climate legislation passed in Maryland. We must remove all false solutions from Maryland's renewable portfolio standard, not add new ones. Thank you. Thank you, Mike Ewell. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Ewald with Energy Justice Network. Energy Justice stands in opposition to House Bill 1366. Zero emissions energy source is a lie. The technologies described in the definition of zero waste and emissions, sorry, zero emissions energy source would not be zero emissions or anywhere close. The only pollutant that would supposedly be zeroed out is carbon dioxide. Compared to burning coal, Burning trees and similar biomass emit 16% more nitrogen oxides that trigger asthma attacks and much higher levels of fine particulate matter that contribute to cancer, heart attacks, and stroke. Dioxins, the most toxic chemicals to science, are released at rates seven times higher than coal. If you want to sequester carbon, let trees grow instead of pretending that cutting and burning them can be done without environmental consequence. Natural gas production also has many more impacts than carbon dioxide including toxic chemicals used in fracking and leaks of methane from extraction and pipelines, 
methane that is 82 times more potent than carbon dioxide over 20 years. The notion that carbon dioxide can be buried and sequestered is also highly dubious. Only Western Maryland seems to have potential due to depleted underground coal and gas deposits. These sites are often fractured and drilled to the point where injecting CO2 is unlikely to stay put. A large scale CO2 leak could actually suffocate an entire town. Do we really want to risk the town of accident, Maryland, living up to its name? This wouldn't be the first. Ask the 49 people who were hospitalized in Sartardia, Mississippi, just two years ago when a CO2 pipeline, CO2 gas pipeline ruptured. Rather than finding ways to put additional polluting sources into the RPS, we'd love to see this committee's cooperation with ending the ratepayer subsidies for technologies that involve extracting and burning fuels. Your support for House Bill 11 would be a lovely alternative to this misguided bill. All right, thank you. So quickly, members, we have three other witnesses on House Bill 1083, um, who went on this list, I kind of got a little bit out of order here. So we'll go back to that. That concludes the hearing uh, for House Bill 1366. We'll take the last three. One is favorable and two are unfavorable. Um, Patrick Wohan, are you here, sir? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to testify this uh, afternoon. Um, Chair Wilson, uh, Chair Cosby, Crosby, members of the Economic Matters Committee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of HB 1083 today. My name is Patrick Wyan. I'm here in two capacities, both as mayor of the city of College Park, uh, whose city council will be voted unanimously to support this bill, and as president of the Prince George's County Municipal Association, whose membership voted unanimously to support this legislation as well. Um, both entities have also submitted written letters uh, supporting HB 1083, which you should have available to you. Um, this bill is uh, would uh, eliminate barriers and in speed investments in energy efficient street lighting uh, by authorizing local governments to assume ownership of the lighting infrastructure uh, and, and uh, enable that uh, to happen more easily so that we can partner directly with the private sector to expedite lighting upgrades. College Park and many Prince George's County municipalities have been attempting for years to acquire greater control over the streetlights around our city. Unfortunately, we've been hampered by the lack of legal authority to purchase them at reasonable rates. Although we appreciate PEPCO's recent efforts to start replacing in very small basis, uh, some of our light fixtures with LEDs, the city would like to pursue this more aggressively around the city and engage with opportunities for new smart streetlight technologies that increase efficiency, save money and reduce environmental impact. Uh, the, to the extent that PEPCO has seen a decrease in the cost of operating the lights as they've replaced them with LEDs, those savings have not trickled down to the city. Uh, just as it would not make sense for a power company to decide the efficiency level of the appliances in our own private homes, maintaining control over street lights with the power company places the incentives in the wrong place. Uh, providing local control over street lights places the incentives for improvements where they belong, with the entities ultimately responsible for paying the bills of local governments. It would also allow greater local control to enable municipalities to utilize our street lighting in a way that better serves our goals for public safety, efficiency, sustainability, and quality community development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of HB 1083. I respectfully request your favorable vote. Thank you. We'll now go to the unfavorables. Kitty Lanzarado. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Crosby, members of the House Economic Matters Committee. Katie Lanzarado again from PEPCO under Marble Power. Uh, with me today, I have Paul LaPerry, our uh, manager of Smart Streetlight Initiatives at PHI. Uh, he is not a registered lobbyist, but has come here at my request to answer any technical questions you may have for our company. You have our written testimony, but I'll add that the genesis of this bill from several years ago was to address a perceived shortcoming of PEPCO for not moving expeditiously enough in converting our streetlights to LEDs and the method by which PEPCO determines fair market value for our streetlight assets. That proved to be a misperception, which is why this legislation introduced in as many as um, 10 different sessions dating back 10 or more years has not advanced. In 2020, PEPCO proposed a plan to roll out street, a street light upgrade program across our Maryland service areas. And while the Public Service Commission did not approve of this program, it did leave the door open for us to go back and modify the proposal and resubmit it. Taking into account the feedback we, uh, we received from the PSC, uh, we anticipate refiling a new voluntary conversion program in the near future, and all interested parties uh, will be afforded an opportunity to be heard in that process before the Public Service Commission. I'd also like to note, and as others have noted already, that there is already existing law that allows counties and municipalities to uh, the right to purchase street lighting equipment from utilities for fair market value. 
Over the years, Pepco has worked with interested counties and municipalities on purchasing streetlights, and ultimately, they've all decided not to purchase the streetlights, whether it be because of cost uh, or maintenance responsibilities. Therefore, we believe that House Bill 1083 is unnecessary, and we respectfully request an unfavorable report on the bill. Thank you. And the final witness for the day, Paul Lapari. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm just here in support of questions on behalf of Katie. Okay. Dougie Queen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I just want to get an understanding from Pepco because I was trying to read the testimony and it seemed like the issue was defining the pricing of it. And so, I mean, the, the, that should be something that's, that seems like an accounting thing that could be figured out very quickly as to what those things cost and why I guess I'm a little concerned that we had testimony that Tacoma Park, you couldn't figure out, it took you a long time to figure out the cost. And then another jurisdiction was told it was, they couldn't have the same pricing as that, that jurisdiction. That, that cost should be on your books. How, how is that determined? The price of these lights, where are you capturing it? I'm gonna defer that one to my colleague, Paul. He'll probably be better able to, to tell you about the evaluation process we go through. Thank you, Doug. Um, I answered directly to um, you know the, the past instances as I was not you know you know part of the company at that point in time, so I do apologize for that ahead of time. Um, you know we the, we do have in you know, what we the book value, and the book value isn't for any specific light. It is for all the lights that are installed within our Pepco tariff uh, mm -hmm. as they go into the common FERC account. So that's where everything ha then has to be pulled out and then disseminated what, you know, to a specific municipality uh, at the aggregate level. Okay, so you have the book value for certain lights and you have a certain quantity and that's all aggregated together. But I, I assume you could extract, you know, extrapolate that they have a third of that or half of that or, you know, what fraction of it. I do not disagree. Uh, as I said, I, I cannot comment on the um, the concerns that were raised from what has happened in, in the past and, and some of the, the differences that may have existed, you know, specifically mm -hmm. around a, a program no longer being available, perhaps why uh, prices could not be uh, held between one uh, uh, municipality to the next. As and, so, and so with this bill right now, where we are, I, I'm still not sure why there's opposition. I guess I'm still not understanding. It seemed like it would be helpful to you if they took it off of your books and, and they took care of it. That'd be less of an expense to have to take care of. You didn't have maintenance on it anymore or replacement on it. The, the opposition delegate is in regards to the, the definition of fair market value, where- Which we just said you can figure out. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't disagree, but there in this particular case, what is being presented is defining a specific formula that should be used that is more in, in line with a, a purchaser than the, the seller in regards to what fair market value you know, really holds to. And so that, we and could amend that. We could amend the, this to correct that. Cor correct. That, that's really the, the, the common point is, you know, if, you know, if someone is looking to sell or buy, um, we don't have a, an opposition to that. Um, you know, we think there's positives of us doing it, but if they so choose, we don't have opposition to that. And in fact, uh, contrary to some of the statements made, our tariffs are already aligned for customer owned lighting and what those tariffs would be. Okay, thank you very much. All right, sorry for the mix up. Uh, that officially concludes the hearing on House Bill 1083 and the hearings for today. Uh, members, uh, I'll see you all soon. Just check your email in case there's any subcommittees. I'm not aware of any coming up, but uh, there may be. Have a great day.